And we'll call the council meeting back to order. Um, do we need another roll call? It's on here. Okay. We'll skip that roll call. And Pastor John Adams. If you'd all, ri all rise, please. Would you bow with me for a moment? God of many names, we give you thanks this day and ask that you be with us for our city, for our leaders, for our community, as we work together to build the vision of a city that will meet the needs of all of its people, young and old, of different races, of different cultures, of different places. Send us your wisdom and strength this night as we move forward in our journey together. This we pray in your holy name. Amen. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to acknowledge that on June the 1st, I made President a proclamation to Ron Pace, honoring him upon his retirement from the Lompoc Unified School District after 46 years at Vandenberg Middle School. Now that is an accomplishment. And on June 7th today, I presented a proclamation out front for the California Torch, uh, the Special Olympics Torch Run, Law Enforcement Torch Run, and while we were doing that, the um, various law enforcement agencies of Santa Barbara County presented a check for $69,000 to the Special Olympics Committee, and that represented approximately 10% of all the money raised by the torch run from Sacramento to Los Angeles and San Diego to Los Angeles, and the gentleman in charge was proud to point out that Santa Barbara County beat both LA and San Diego County. So kudos for, for the law enforcement folks, which included our own police department, other area police departments, the sheriff's department, the prison, and the military police from Vandenberg Air Force Base. So yeah, it was really great. And now, the main event. It gives me great pleasure to introduce, introduce Colonel Richard Boltz, the 30th Space Wing Western Range Commander, and Command Master Chief Sergeant Johnson, who backs him up and keeps him out of trouble. Good evening. I, I must admit I'm a little nervous being described as the main event. Um, <laughs> at least uh, not the main dish at dinner. But, uh, uh, good evening, Mayor Lynn, council members, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Thank you for asking me uh, here to speak with you this evening, and uh, I'm really excited uh, to give you an update, a little bit about what's going on at Vandenberg, and, and hopefully make it meaningful uh, for you and, and everyone in attendance this evening. <clears throat> As you know, Vandenberg is the single uh, largest employer in North County. We employ nearly 3,000 military, 1,200 government civilians, and 3,000 contractors. Vandenberg's economic impact is roughly $1.7 billion to the local economy. In a recent University of California Santa Barbara study, it was determined that every dollar spent at Vandenberg generates another 92 cents in business. Whether it's folks going to lunch, staying in your hotels, or residing in your neighborhoods, Vandenberg's more than 7,000 employees certainly make an impact within your community. The 30 Space Wing's mission is to provide combat capability to the joint warfighter through assured access to space and combat-ready airmen. The Missile Defense Agency, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, and the National Reconnaissance Office all have offices here supporting our national defense and research. Many of your residents support these organizations every day. Recently, we've worked together to strengthen our ties to the community, and you're seeing some of the results now. Yet I know we can do better. 
I'd like to mention some of the details and about, about an important resource we have to further bind our communities. Vandenberg Air Force Base has a senior government civilian, Mr. Uh, Jim Maston, whose primary responsibility is to ensure that small businesses are given a fair shake in dealing with Vandenberg and competing effectively for our business. His office, aptly named the Small Business Office, does a number of things to support this mission. First, Mr. Maston meets with local small businesses on a weekly basis and generally here in town. He also meets with large businesses interested in teaming with the many small businesses currently vying for contracts at Vandenberg. This helps the large companies meet government requirements to support small business and helps the small businesses leverage, it, leverage the large businesses' expertise and capabilities. Air Force Space Command, which is the major command uh, that I ultimately work for, gives Vandenberg Air Force Base a target uh, that says that at least 85% of our services and support must come from small businesses each year and Mr. Maston's office monitors our progress towards that goal. This is more good news for the surrounding communities as it encourages us to facilitate business with smaller companies to meet that goal. We're well on our way for meeting that 85% goal this year, but there are always opportunities for growth. You can find our long-range acquisition estimate posted on the Air Force Small Business website for insight into larger and continuing future requirements. This estimate generally provides a one or two year outlook for our upcoming requirements, and this can help forecast growth opportunities. This slide that you see up here shows the address for our small business website. You can, as always, call Mr. Maston for additional details as well, and his contact information is provided. Additionally, uh, I've left uh, a stack of uh, Mr. Maston's business cards uh, with our public affairs, uh, public outreach uh, officer, Mr. Hill, and, and he'll have those available uh, for your use. Now, in ensuring we meet our goal, uh, Mr. Maston briefs small businesses as needed to aid in their understanding of how to contract with the government. I know that understanding the, the government contracting business can be challenging, but he's, he's there to help. He'll sit down with uh, your companies and walk them through the Small Business Administration, the Central Contractor Registration, and Federal Business Opportunities website. As we uh, move on and, and as you guys expre uh, express more interest in this type of activity, I encourage you to take advantage of this resource that's available. This past March, Mr. Maston held a small business conference on Vandenberg with the goal of providing vendors information on a wide, wide range of uh, small business and contracting topics. He'll hold another one next March, and uh, we'll certainly uh, work through our public affairs officer to make sure that you have that information available uh, to use as, as you uh, would like. The bottom line is that Mr. Maston and I are here to help both of our communities benefit by working more closely together. Now, you have all likely uh, read of the many successes that Vandenberg uh, has experienced over the past year. And what's key is that we could not be as successful as we have been without you, our community partners. With the launch of the West Coast's first ever Delta IV Heavy, the largest rocket in the U.S. inventory, Lompoc housed, fed, supported the team of scientists, engineers, and technicians brought in to make this launch a success this past January. If these folks weren't able to have their basic needs met by the local community as we pushed them through the long hours and stressful days, we probably would not have been as successful. This mission launched a classified payload for the National Reconnaissance Office. Now, while I can't talk about the capability, the specific capabilities of the satellite, you should know that the satellite is exactly in the right place in orbit where we needed it to be, and it's providing an incredible capability to our national policymakers and warfighters every day. And thank you for making this support possible. Last December, our communities uh, benefited from the strong relationship that we share this time. It was with the X-37B. The X-37B is a reliable, reusable, unmanned platform developed for space experimentation, risk reduction, and a concept of operations for reusable space technologies. You're all familiar with the large rockets that we launch at Vandenberg. In this impressive display of engineering prowess, the X-37 was able to fit in the payload fairing of an X-37 that was launched from Cape Canaveral in Florida. And then after spending nearly eight months on orbit, the X-37 made an autonomous landing on Vandenberg's 15,000 foot runway. 
As remarkable as this actual landing was, it served only as an exclamation point to the massive, <coughs> excuse me, behind the scenes base-wide effort that evolved over a two-year period. <coughs> excuse me. Last October and November, we were pretty busy. Uh, it was a very, very busy time for our team. Uh, we prepared for and excelled through a massive biannual inspection of our by our headquarters uh, inspector general. This inspection tested our personnel and our capabilities thoroughly. We're proud to report that we achieved, re achieved an excellent rating, and this was the first such rating in over two years for any base within Air Force Space Command. In addition, Air Force Space Command recognized 23 teams and 27 individuals for their outstanding effort. And those 27 teams and 27 individuals represented more than 400 of Vandenberg's finest airmen. It really was a, a remarkable achievement. Overall, it was a highly successful inspection, and I'd like to thank you for your patience through the tests that backed up our gates and, what, and some of those events that actually turned out to be real-world events. <clears throat> As you likely recall, during this period, um, we also had an arcing power line that ignited a small fire on South Base near Bear Creek Road. The whole community jumped in and helped right away. Lompoc, as has been the case for the better part of the last decade, was the quickest to respond with help. A multi-agency em emergency response team from throughout the Central Coast helped fight the f uh, fire. Uh, and at, in the end, we had nearly 150 personnel, 28 fire engines, seven bulldozers, three helicopters, and two fixed-wing aircraft. They worked to contain the blaze, and I'd just like to step through a few of these pictures. Uh, I got to tell you, one of the things that uh, really had me worried um, was the wind that was coming up and uh, the fact that it was uh, heading towards an area where we store some, um, some rocket fuel. Uh, the good news is the, the, the close partnership and cooperation that we've developed with our local communities to include Lompoc is that uh, when your folks arrived on scene, uh, there was no learning curve. Uh, our firefighters know your for firefighters, and they worked effectively as a team, and uh, they took what could have turned out to be uh, quite a huge disaster and uh, uh, contained the fire within three days with no loss of uh, facilities, no personal injuries, and most importantly, uh, no fatalities. As you can see, it was a, a pretty massive effort. <clears throat> if it were not for our incredible working relationships that we have with local communities like Lompoc, the fire could have had much greater, far-reaching negative impacts. Thankfully, the team masterfully fought and contained the fire bec before it could uh, affect our ability to launch uh, satellites. And I sincerely thank you for the cooperation uh, between our two communities that averted this, uh, this uh, potential disaster. Speaking of, of the support um, your community provides Vandenberg, I'd like to briefly talk about some of the medical services relationship that we have. The 30th Medical Group serves a population of over 13,000 patients providing primary care, pharmacy, laboratory, optometry, and physical therapy services for our active duty members, retirees, and their family members. In order to provide services to so many personnel, we rely heavily on the communities to provide critical referral support through specialty providers and especially urgent and emergent care. The Lompoc community serves as the 30th Medical, Group, Medical Group's primary support system, accounting for 37% of all referrals from the group. The support consists of urgent care, emergency room services, pediatric and internal medicine services. When demand for patient care exceeds appointment availability at Vandenberg, the Lompoc community is always poised to meet the needs of our beneficiaries. The mutually beneficial relationship between Vandenberg Air Force Base and the city of Lompoc directly contributes $3.1 million a year to the Lompoc economy. The support Lompoc provides Vandenberg Air Force Base continues to grow with the construction of the new hospital in Lompoc. Obstet obstetric services uh, have expanded to offer additional high-quality support for our maternity patients. As the relationship of support progresses, we hope to see further growth of pediatric obstetrics gynecology and psychiatry services in order to offer a better network of care for our patients. Your support keeps Vandenberg personnel ready to support duty 24-7. This week, Vandenberg is prepared to host a large contingent of people from Argentina here to witness the launch uh, of the uh, satellite that's on the Delta II rocket, uh, the launch of the Aquarius. This is an international mission designed primarily to measure the salt levels in our oceans. 
After launch, the satellite will provide a global view of the salinity variability needed for climate studies. The satellite will fly on, as I said, on the Delta II. It'll launch out of Space Launch Complex 3 at uh, 7.20 in the morning. It's a five minute window, so you can hang around and, and wait for it to, to go. So if you get a chance, I encourage you to step out of your car uh, uh, on your way to work maybe. Uh, if, if, you, if you heard it, it's too late, it's already gone. Uh, but from 7.20 to about 7.25. Uh, Brazil, Canada, France, Italy, Argentina, and the United States all have a role that they'll play in the launch of this satellite, and we're looking forward to it. Now, also this summer, Vandenberg will be supporting the Air Force Global Strike Command as it conducts the first of three Minutemen intercontinental ballistic missile tests. The Vandenberg team will launch the next hypersonic test vehicle from Space Launch, launch Complex 8 later this summer, testing new composite materials for the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, the National Polar Orbiting Operational Environmental Satellite System Preparatory Project, essentially that's a long string of words for it's a new weather satellite uh, that we're going to be launching, and uh, we're sort of excited about that too. That also will go out of Space Launch Complex 2. Our team is also working diligently preparing for another launch from Space Launch Complex 6, sending another classified satellite into space aboard a Delta IV rocket. We have a handful of other major projects in work now totaling $60 million. Vandenberg will build a new $14.2 million, 39,000 square foot education center in fiscal year 12. The new center will provide a consolidated, centrally located team of professionals providing higher education to our personnel. There'll be increased space for colleges and universities to continue to grow. We'll also be adding to our current fitness center to help our personnel maintain peak physical fitness and be prepared to deploy at a moment's notice. The fitness center will be roughly $12 million worth and will add another 39,000 square feet to our existing facility to meet the demand. Many of you are aware of Vandenberg's ongoing housing privatization. The community benefits from this effort as well. With only 999 houses, that means that two-thirds of our 3,000 military personnel reside in off-base communities, and many of those uh, live, buy homes here in Lompoc or rent from local landlords. I'd also like to take this opportunity to discuss a new customer coming to Vandenberg. SpaceX is now setting up operations at Space Launch Complex 4 on South Base. The team plans to launch two of its new launch vehicles starting as early as 2013. Work is currently underway at Space Launch Complex 4 to prepare for launch pad refurbishment and to meet design specifications. The team plans to take down the existing infrastructure from the Heritage Titan days and they will, uh, they will <coughs> excuse me, they'll take down the mobile service tower and the umbilical tower as part of this effort, and they'll build a new integration hangar for, to prepare the launch uh, vehicles from the old Space Launch Complex 4. A groundbreaking ceremony will take place upon the approval of the full operating license, and my team will continue to provide details to you as they become available. With that, I'd like to thank you again for inviting me to be here, Mr. Mayor. Your continued support of Vandenberg community is appreciated and absolutely essential to our current and future successes. Thanks for having me and Chief Johnson. We appreciate the Colonel working us into his extremely busy schedule. Thank you so very much. We appreciate the Colonel working us into his extremely busy schedule. Thank you so very much. And now our city administrator, executive director's status report. Honorable Mayor, City Council members, audience and viewers, I would take this opportunity to advise that the council appointed single purpose committee is working with the committee city staff to finalize their findings and recommendations uh, related to the improvements uh, for building, planning and engineering processes and procedures. Uh, while the list of proposed future City Council uh, uh, agenda items notes these uh, committee recommendations will be on the Council meeting for June 21st. 
The meeting, uh, the committee chair will be unable to attend that meeting and is requesting this item be agendized for the meeting in July, uh, which staff will honor with council's support. And that's all I have tonight. Thank you. Are there any other staff requests and announcements? Uh, Councilmember Lingle, I'm sorry. Uh, just a comment. Uh, Ms. Barcelona, I just want to comment that on a some pretty regular basis, including comment today, I heard from people that are coming to the city for planning and building, and there's been many positive comments. So whether it's the, the perception, uh, the single purpose committee, you're working with the staff, um, something is happening and I really appreciate it, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, staff requests and announcements, anything else? No? Okay, and now we have a council development agency request for, um, this is a discussion of term limits requested by council member Costa and we'll have a presentation from our city administrator and maybe the city attorney, you guys gonna tag team us? Mayor and Council, I'll present the report. We thought we'd get him out there with you, but I guess it's not going to happen. Honorable Mayor, City Council members, audience and viewers, the report before you pertaining to term limits for Mayor and City Council members recommends that the Council provide direction to the City Administrator, City Clerk and City Attorney whether uh, to take all necessary actions to prepare a city initiated ballot measure uh, for the November 7, 2012 regular municipal election established uh, term to establish term limits for the mayor and city council members. And if the direction is to prepare the ballot measure, then also indicate the number of consecutive terms the mayor and council members can serve the number of years, if any, that uh, must transpire between the limited terms before uh, the mayor and council members can serve again, um, and whether the break between terms applies to a mayor running for a council seat or vice versa. Uh, this staff report has been agendized in response to council's request during the council workshops held late last year and early this year when the council uh, directed the city attorney to return with a staff report regarding the possibility of establishing term limits for the mayor and city council. At that time, council member Costa provided a memo and suggested text for the proposed ballot measure and copies of both are attached to uh, the staff report. And city clerk Stacy Alvarez also obtained a survey of all California cities, which shows uh, those with and without term limits, noting the different types of term limits. And at this time, I will uh, turn the podium over to City Clerk Alvarez, who will uh, go through the findings of this survey, and she'll complete the presentation on this report. Good evening, Mayor and Council. On April 20th, 2011, the City Clerk's Office received a copy of a survey completed by the City of Thousand Oaks for all California cities regarding term limits. The State of California has a total of 481 incorporated cities. 383 cities, or 80%, do not have term limits. And 98 cities, or 20%, do have some form of term limits for their council or mayor. Term limits have been approved in both general law and charter cities with small, medium, and large populations, but are far more common in large population cities with full-time mayors and council members, and much less common in cities with part-time mayors and council members. Only one of the eight cities in Santa Barbara County, the city of Santa Barbara, has established term limits for its council. Those term limits are two consecutive four-year terms for council, two consecutive four-year terms for directly elected mayor, and the, you cannot have more than four consecutive terms as council member or mayor. For the city of Lompoc, mayor's term is only two years, 
compared to the council members' four-year terms. It seems a different term limit for those positions should be considered. Also to be considered would be how partial years would be counted toward the term limit calculation. Government code dictates term limit initiatives must go on the ballot for a vote of the people at a regularly scheduled election. The council does not have the option to adopt straight out. Adding a ballot measure to the 2012 city election would likely add $8,000 to $9,000 to the city's election budget. Council is requested to provide direction as to whether staff should take actions necessary to place a measure on the November 7, 2012 Lompoc election regarding term limits and what the specifics of the limitations should be. That concludes the staff report and we're available for questions. Are there any questions at this time? Thank you. Okay, now we'll open this to public comment. Is there anyone that would like to speak on this subject? Come on down. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Ralph Harmon, Lompoc. Uh, number one, the, the cost factor to do a, an election is obscene at this time when we can't even afford uh, to fund our, our public safety officers. So uh, that's number one. The other thing is we already have term limits. It's called an election in a ballot box. People can't get out and vote. Well, they get stuck with what they have or they're happy with what they have. So I, I think you should just table this. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Um. My name is Marilyn Rodez, and I live in the Lompoc Valley, Vandenberg Village. Uh, I have given a, a letter to the city clerk, Stacy Albert, um, to uh, give to each of you, or I guess I can do it myself if you'd like. Pass it's them down. down. <laughs> uh, that's just for your own information. I, I'm going to read the letter that I have written. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm attending tonight's uh, city council meeting to give recognition to the Aquatic Center of Lompoc. The center is a major asset to the city, county, and other areas of the, the Central Coast. Recognized for its fulfillment of community well-being, need, example, and pride. The facility and its operations are skillfully maintained and supported by a team of highly trained and experienced people that have a great respect in working for the public good. I have participated for almost two years in two different programs, low impact aquatic exercise uh, recommended by the medical world and aquatic step aerobic classes. And I've attended uh, both classes uh, for the most part, uh, two hours, three days a week. During this time, I have seen a stream of all ages benefit from this center. It is safe, clean, extremely well run, and fun. A definite five-star operation. In the last four years of operation, they have consistently shown their dedication to the remarkable achievement in lowering costs and increasing revenues thereby reducing city subsidy. Please allow this excellent performance to continue by leaving the present team in place under city management and not risk messing up a good thing. It's working and I thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, let me, I, I let her go ahead because I hate to stop somebody in the middle, but I'd like to, we're going to get to that in just a minute, but I'd like to take any testimony with regard to term limits first. Is there anybody else wants to talk about term limits? No. Oh, it's okay, Marilyn. No, no, no. Yeah, not a problem. We're a friendly place. Um, is there anyone that wanted to talk about term limits? Uh, Mayor and City Council, I just want to make a brief comment. Uh, I Got to say your name. Mary Saladino. Thank you. In regard to uh, the decision as to what term limits should be in regard to Lompoc, City of Lompoc in Santa Barbara County, 
I believe I understood you to say that it has to be done by ballot and that that costs quite a bit of money. I would just want to say, can that be added on to another, at another time when it, is it have to be totally separate from anything else? When we put an item on the ballot, we pay for just that item. So it's not like we have to pay for the whole thing, but we do have to pay for that item. So instead of being like $40,000, it's like 9,000, but there is a cost to Whether there's another election going on at the same time. Well, we wouldn't do it if there wasn't another election because it would be very expensive. Well, that's a big expense. Yes, it is. That's one of the one of the considerations. Thank you. Anyone else that would like to speak on on the term limit issue? Okay, seeing no one rise, we'll close this and bring it back to council and I will afford council member Costa the first word on this since she's the one that submitted it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, in the memo that was given to Council, um, those were just pieces of what I've learned over the years about term limits and the positive impact. I definitely see um, that there are drawbacks to term limits as well. Um, but in my personal opinion, I believe that the benefit far exceeds uh, the drawbacks in, in the case of term limits. In addition, I do think we have a good thing going with the five of us up here. But if there is any legacy I would like to leave, it is that this uh, trend continues and that um, we do not see a uh, political careerist uh, sitting on the dais in Lompoc um, from this point forward. That's really my opinion on it. Um, I think that invigorating with new and fresh ideas is very important. Um, I think that the proof is in the pudding um, on the state level. It just shows, um, and, and on other levels as well, it shows that um, more minorities, more women get involved. Um, it levels the playing field. It's very difficult to run against an incumbent. Um, it's, it's possible, but it's very difficult. Um, and I think that after eight years in the council seat, I think you've had eight years to do some great work. And I think that um, eight years is a sufficient period of time. And that's why I wanted to present this for discussion, of course, um, trying to figure out how the council feels. Now, this is the first time that I'm seeing uh, the cost. I was not aware of the ballot cost. I knew that there was cost associated, but it is looking at, at the maximum, it would be 9,000, and the minimum would be somewhere around $5,000. So we're looking anywhere from five to $9,000. And I definitely think that's something we should take into consideration. Um, but that's sort of the first bite at the apple. And, and um, you know, there's much more I could say in regards to term limits, but no, that's okay. That's, that was sort of my, my general statement. Thank you. Councilmember Barner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, I did want to clarify according to the financial impact from the report. It states uh, that it will cost somewhere between $5,000 to $6,000, uh, which goes to printing of ballots, sample, sample ballots, and election pamphlets. An additional estimated 3000 might be needed for services. So it could be anywhere from $5,000 to $9,000. Uh, it is something to be considered. Um, I will give you what I've seen in Lompoc. Lompoc had a long tradition of having council members be at this dais for a long time. I have to say that in the last two years, three years, we have seen a turnover. There are new faces up here. That is, speaks to term limits. People do get tired of having career politicians up here. I think we, our job is to serve the community. I think we can do that with two terms, and then it's time for somebody else to do it. Um, staying here for longer than that, it becomes something else. It does not become to be, to serve the community and to do public service. It becomes a career, or it becomes a retirement plan. It becomes a hobby. It becomes many other things, but the bottom line is serving the community. And I think every resident in this town should have the opportunity to serve like we are serving here. And I think term limits is very healthy. So I will propose and I will be willing to spend up to $9,000 to put it in the ballot so the public can decide because you should decide, not us. And we should give you the opportunity to speak out and say whether you would like term limits or not. So I will make, um, I will actually support this uh, proposal that is being put on the table here tonight. Next, Councilmember Lingle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Um, whether we bring this forward or not, I don't think it's going to affect any of us on this dais. So what we're going to be doing is making a decision for future councils. Um, almost every possibility that we talk about tonight is going to take effect with the election in 2012. Assuming those of us that will be running in 2012, assuming, us, assuming that we're reelected, that would still, even the minimum term, you would still be allowed to take on two additional terms, two additional four-year terms, which at my age, I don't know if I'd want to run <laughs> that long. But, and um, except for Council Member Costa, she may want to make it a career. Um, obviously not, since she brought it forward. So that's why I say it's probably not going to affect any of us. So what we are going to be doing is making a decision for future councils. Uh, so I, I really don't have any pros or cons for myself. I don't think we do for the rest of the council. But I think what we have to do is look at some of the things that have been discussed. There must be a reason why only 20% of the cities in California choose to have term limits. The minority or the majority of that 20% are charter cities. Now, I don't know, maybe the attorney can help me with this, what difference that makes, why a charter city um, would choose to have term limits and not a general law city. But it, when I was looking over that list, it seems the majority of cities that, of the 20% that do have term limits are charter cities. There must be something in there why they would want to be. Um, it's, it's been mentioned that we do have term limits or self-imposed or not self-imposed, but term limits at the ballot box. Mr. Harmon made a good point. Um, all of us are sitting here tonight, except for I believe the mayor, um, that has unseated an incumbent. Every one of us have done that other, other than the mayor. So the election or the ballot box does work. The cost of five to ten thousand dollars, not a lot of money, but it is money in a time that we're talking about not being able to provide some public safety, not being able to provide support for our library, our um, our aquatic center, our uh, uh, I'm sorry, yes, exactly. What if, <laughs> okay. Um, I want to hear from the rest of the council members before I actually dis say well, how I will support the, or how I will or will not support this. But at this point, I'm leading, and I don't know if it really has, is going to serve a purpose for us. I'm leaning that way, but I'd like to hear from the rest of you before I make that decision. Councilmember Starbuck, <clears throat> thank you. Who uh, wants to be the career politician up here? Yeah, that's me. Um, I think after eight years, you should probably be examined truthfully. I mean, it's a long, it's a lot of time. I, I think my decision on this, I, I'm going to really look at it because it's kind of a, a little bit of a different scenario, I think, here. When you have two council come up every two years that are four year, and you have a mayor come up every two years. So I think before I would even give a consideration, I'd like to see how this whole rotation would be laid out. What would we really want? The mayor do four terms, council members do two terms. Is there a standoff period then? Does the mayor run back into the council? Does a council member run for mayor? Um, I'm not sure what we could all agree on tonight. I'm sure we couldn't do it by midnight, but I would, um, my decision is going to be based basically on how we work that out and probably um, a lot of community input because, I mean, let's face it, who's going to foot the bill for the election? And I got to say, I really do believe in the natural purging of the offices too. So I mean, I, I I don't know. Okay, my turn. Um, what I had actually um, spoke in favor of many times was a uh, a primary and a in a general election, because one of the difficulties that you have in running in a council election is that there can be a large number of candidates and a large number of candidates always benefits the incumbent and that's probably the one thing that keeps incumbents in place more than anything else 
However, comma, I learned that that costs about an extra $30,000, and that didn't seem like a very good idea right after that. Um, A friend of mine who's been here a really long time said that uh, that there is a historical cycle that occasionally occurs in Lompoc and apparently in other communities where, for whatever reason, the um, the electorate becomes unhappy with what's being done and a whole bunch of faces change on the dais. And that apparently happened in the mid-70s and somewhere back in the 30s. And so the electorate has a way of enforcing term limits when they don't feel that what they want to get done is being done. So the question in my mind, and, and I'm frankly I'm not willing to make a decision tonight unless you guys force me into a corner because I want to talk to some more people about it, um, is whether you allow the electorate to enforce term limits or if you create this mechanism. If you'd asked me two years ago, um, I probably would have been a very strong advocate for term limits. But then the electorate did what the electorate's supposed to do and so perhaps I'm a little less strong. And one of the things that my dad taught me a whole lot of years ago is that many things in life are a pendulum and pendulums like to hang in the center but they occasionally get pushed out to the side and the further they get out to the side the more gravity tries to pull them back to the center and I think that's the case of the voters the further something gets off the track for what the voters perceive is the right thing that gets done then the more likely there'll be a change so there you go Councilmember Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Council, for your comments. I just wanted to uh, respond to Councilmember Starbucks' concern. Um, what I had attached here was um, a sample of what I would like to see uh, occur um, in, in the research that I've done in the other cities that do implement term limits, um, and that would be the two successive four-year terms for Council, four successive two-year terms for Mayor. So again, those are both opportunities to serve for a total of eight years, um, and then a um, period of four years that would need to pass before uh, an individual can run for office again. Now, what that doesn't uh, deal with is the idea that after serving eight years as a council member, is it okay for you to run for mayor? And that right there, it, although it may be seen as a loophole, for me, keeping that option open, the, the, the large complaint I heard uh, f as far as term limits is that if I like somebody, I should be able to reelect them as many times as I'd like. Well, that would give the opportunity for that. It's very difficult for a candidate to change title positions to move from council member to mayor or mayor to council member. It's just, it's, it's, it's something, it makes it much more difficult for an individual to win a seat that way. However, if they are in the case that popular or they are doing that great of a job after eight years that they would like to run for mayor and will get elected for mayor, in that case, I think that's okay. I, I think that allowing that loophole is okay. Um, but for me, a, a total of eight years um, in one seat with one role is uh, what I would suggest, and that's what I wrote in the, um, what, what I would like to see in the measure if it was accepted. I understand if, if uh, you all are interested in getting more public comment, I have been getting a lot of people reaching out to me as well in regards to this, and so I would be okay with um, tabling it for all of us to really take the time to make uh, the decision, um, you know, because I don't think there is enough representation on both sides at this point. Um, so that's okay with me if, if you're okay with that. I'm just really interested in keeping the discussion alive. Thank you. No. Yeah. I'm just going to go ahead of you and be mean. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I'd like to do some more fact-finding on it, and I think the clerk's report has bought, brought up some things we would need to look at to fine-tune this. And now, Councilmember Lingle. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I also would support that we, we're in no rush right now. It's uh, two years before the next uh, 
uh, ballots going to be coming out, so we have plenty of time to do it, get more public input on it before we do it. But addressing uh, Councilmember Costa's suggestion, <laughs> keeping the conversation alive, I believe that if we have term limits, I think a two-year break as opposed to a four-year break would be more appropriate. Um, that way, if the public has decided to, let's say, unseat one of us and bring in someone else and it was not necessarily what the public wanted, that person, the person that was unseated, had an opportunity to come back at the next election and correct that. So I'd be more in favor of a, a two-year break as opposed to a four-year break. The other thing I'd like us to make sure that we address is partial terms. Um, a resignation, a death, where someone, at which unfortunately we had just recently, where someone comes in and fills a partial term, uh, several months, uh, several days, several weeks, would that count as a full term or would that be a non-term? And I would say that that should be a non-term, whether it's um, in almost, you know, let's say it's three and a half years or three and a half days. I would say that we make a decision that it's probably a non-term. Um, but that aside, I, th I think it, I'd be in favor of just tabling this and getting more public input and bring it back at a future date. Um. I, I'm good with that, but I would like to have a date certain because I don't like things to go on forever. Oh, I'm sorry, Cecilia. Councilmember Martner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I guess by you know listening to the council, it looks like we need more details uh, as far as uh, you know the ifs and and all of that. And um, I would expect that is it the legal council that would have to look at the details of how when create you know when vacancies are created and how is that term considered and all of that kind of stuff is that a report coming from the legal council or or is there some other body within the staff that has to do this if i may through the mayor i'm, I'm not sure that there's more input that you need from the staff there's policy decisions that need to be made and the information you need to make those decisions I think are before you, okay. I'm not saying you need to make a decision tonight, but I'm not sure that there's any additional information we could give you um, because they're, they're really questions. And the questions that you need to be answered, that need to be answered are in the staff report and you've addressed them already or, or attempted to start discussing them. We just need a conclusion on those questions. Okay, now the next thing is about public input. Um, you know, I, we need to ask the public to come and contact us, uh, send us emails or whatever to give their, uh, you know, their opinion. Um, I see the Lompoc record here. Could we run some kind of, uh, you know, ask the question, ask the public or something in which, uh, you know, go out there in the streets and ask, what do you think? Should Lompoc have term limits? So I would like to throw that out to the Lompoc record and see if we can get some more input. Um, I, I am willing to table it as long as it's something that can be looked at and decided before the next general elections. Um, and, and in that, I will concur with the mayor that we need to give it a date certain. And I would say, you know, three months? Is that like, you know, at the end of the summer, we should be able to get a good feeling from the Lompoc constituency, whether they think that uh, spending anywhere between $6,000 to $9,000 is a good idea to put it on the ballot for term limits. Councilmember Lingle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I agree with the attorney that we really have all the data in front of us right now. The only thing I believe we're saying right now is we need public input or we'd like public input. So then the question comes to me is do we want it that public input at a council meeting like this, or do we want it in a workshop? I'd be more in favor of a, a workshop. Um, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, something like that, put in. That's the only thing on the agenda. Let the people come uh, discuss it, and then we bring it back to the council for a decision. So I'd like to see a workshop as opposed to a date certain workshop as opposed to a, a date certain council meeting. Um, yeah, I'm okay with that, but. I think we might want to pick up a topic or two at the same time. So, yeah, I think that would be a good idea. What, what do you guys think about that? Councilmember Martin? 
you know, I find that usually workshop attendance is very poor and we usually get, you know, single digits. Um, yes, we can have a workshop. I'd be very much willing to, uh, to take a look at that, but I'm really looking for, for you know, input um, in the form of email, phone calls, the paper, letters to the editor, whatever, input. Um, you know, I don't have to have a face-to-face, -face, but just uh, people telling us what they think. Okay, perhaps we could impose upon uh, the news press representative and the Lompoc record representative to include our emails for each of us in the, in the uh, piece you put in so people could respond to us. And then if we would hand it off to our city administrator. Um, and rather than setting a dead-on date, how about if we set a um, September date? So we'll do it in September, and you you can be in charge of the date. Is everybody that a September date for the workshop or for for the, for the workshop to make the decision, and that'll give us some time to talk to people. Everybody good with that? You can all nod up and down. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, it's. I think we'll get there. I think we'll get there. Okay, there you go. Well, I was just going to mention, Mayor and Council, you you can you know be flexible with this, and if you decide a different route, then you know we can you can advise me, and that's the way we'll yeah. uh, look at this. Okie doke. And next, we will move to. Council requests. We have the next. We'll move to oral communication. So, those of you who want to talk about something else, Mr. Mayor, could we just have one brief thing with uh, council requests and announcements? Um, sure. Okay. Sorry, guys. Hold on a sec. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I just wanted this because I wanted to make sure that if anyone's out there, they get to hear this before heaven goes to bed. I think we owe the Lompoc Braves baseball team a real. Uh, congratulations on the successful year they had. Um, I was listening to the game. Unfortunately, I wasn't down there watching. I was listening to the game, and it was a edge-of-the-seat nail-biter. Um, what a fantastic year they had, and what a bunch of fantastic kids. So congratulations, Lompoc Braves, on another successful year in sports. Thank you. Thank you, and that reminds me of one thing that's behind me. Um, once in a while, and as mayor, you get to have fun. And the other day, my friend, and, I'm, and I apologize, mental blank, um, he, he's a, a docent with me at the mission, and he's one of the soldiers, and it just won't come to me, so I'm going to give up. But this is the fire map of Lompoc from September of 1886. And years ago, I was at the Malakoff Digging State Historical Park, and I saw one of these, and I said, what is that? Because it has the houses drawn in. They said, that's the map that independent, an independent company would come in and draw all the buildings. Because fire insurance companies didn't come out and look at a town. They did it all by mail. And so you had to be on the map to buy fire insurance. But the thing that I'd like to read to you that I think is quite important, because you'll know that our city was founded two years later. This is from the Sanborn Map Publishing Company Limited, and I, I paid to have it framed so it can go in the mayor's office. And we had a population of 300. We had no steam engine and no hand engines. That's for fire suppression. We had no hose carts. And our water facilities were not good. <laughs> the ground was level, and the prevailing winds were from the west. <laughs> and the other largest thing on here, which was probably the largest thing in town, and I know there's somebody in the audience who remembers this, was the Lompoc Flour, F-L-O-U-R apostrophe G Mills, custom mills with a capacity of 20 barrels per day. 
and that was the big excitement in Lompoc. So uh, I'll have put this over on the side table when we take a break. I encourage all of you to look at it, and if anybody would like one, I think they cost me $1.30 to run them off, and you're welcome to have one. The frame was a little more. You should have done it for the fire department. Yeah, I can give them one, too. Okay, we'll get one for the fire department, too, because uh, one of the things that, one of the reasons that um, municipal governments were formed, matter of fact, as I'm told, one of the principal reasons was fire protection. And as you can tell from that, ours wasn't too good. So two years later, we became a city and assumedly uh, had our fire protection. Okay, now for oral communications and who would like to address us on any subject. Hi, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Joellen Crones. I've been in Lompoc since 1957. My husband just retired, well, didn't just retire, but he was a battalion chief for uh, Lompoc Fire Department for 31 years, Tom Crones. Anyway, we want to say how fantastic we think the pool facility is and how we think the management is uh, doing a fantastic job. We understand they've cut the expenses from 450000 to 210000 uh, we're very concerned about it going to the YMCA because we th feel that we'll have to pay YMCA fees plus because they're wanting to make a profit they're going to raise the fees for everything and less people will go and they'll end up giving it back to you uh, probably not in the condition that it's in now so we think it's a fantastic facility and the Lompoc should be so proud that they have from what I understand, the most used pool from San Jose, I mean, no, San Luis to San Diego has more activity than any other pool, city pool. And I think it should be one of the biggest pri prides of Lompoc and should be kept in the property of Lompoc and controlled by the management that's working with it now. So thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, council members, my name is Salty Huncherick. <clears throat> Pardon me. I wrote a letter to the editor the other day complaining about the wise interest in taking over the operation and programming of the city's aquatic center and the probability that I would have to become a member of the Y in order to pay the reduced rate for lap swimming daily the Y offers its members. I currently belong to Walnut Pier and go to the Aquatic Center six days a week. <clears throat> the editor of the Lompoc Record, Mr. Bo Partner, phoned me to tell me he thought I was operating under a wrong impression and suggested I call Dan Powell of the Y, read my uh, concerns over fees, which I did. Mr. Powell stated the lower rates would remain the same, but I was misinformed regarding who wanted to take over. Mr. Powell stated the city approached the Y to take over. Now I found this difficult to understand, being the present management of the pool went from needing a subsidy of about 412 grand in year 2078 to needing about 210 grand for the year 1110. If the Y took over, they would receive the same subsidy. To me, the only logical explanation was a city must save money by getting rid of managing the pool and letting the Y take over management. In this case, during this era of transparency of government, has someone something been said directly present management you know it's it's possible if this is the reason that present uh, management should be congratulated on doing a fantastic job of uh, giving sterling recommendations and uh, let the uh, government uh, the uh, city get on with this business of saving money and then we could all get on with with what, whatever is going on. Definitely the present management did a great job and in reducing costs and getting more business. 
Here I was, along with many other women in the locker room, hostile towards the why for wanting to horn in on a very successful program, when all the time that was an incorrect supposition. Maybe the mayor and council would like to make an official statement telling why this move is going to be, or not be, so we can quit fretting and proceed on with no hostility towards any change. I'd also like to add that to come to the idea of whether or not to maintain president, present management, you have to be real careful because the matter of, of present management has been quite successful ironing out a lot of problems so they have the advantage of experience. But again, I don't know the budget. I don't know the cost. Thank you for your time. Let me fill in a little information. Um, as part of our budget workshop, we discussed the possibility, this among many, many others, of searching out someone who could take over the aquatic center. Because the YMCA runs a lot of aquatic centers, they were asked if they would be interested in making a proposal. Realize that no decision has been made and they haven't even actually made a proposal yet. Um, based on that, they met with the city staff and looked at our facility and how it was operated. When they came back with a preliminary proposal, it was a savings of yeah, 30000 a year over two years, so 60000 in the budget cycle. And it was an increase in the programming at the same rates that were currently being charged. However, that was a, just a preliminary proposal from them. As part of the budget process, we took reserve money that was in the pool account because of some prior cost savings and we applied that reserve money to this two-year budget's uh, subsidy, if you will, to operate the pool and reduced that operating cost by an amount equal to what the YMCA had proposed. And we did that so that we would be comparing apples and apples later on, I guess, and if the YMCA proposal came through, then the budget would be correct. And if the YMCA proposal didn't come through, we were going to use that little bit of reserve money that we'd save from being under budget in the prior two years. It was pool money that we didn't spend that was budgeted for it. So, yes, we asked the YMCA if they would like to make a proposal. Their preliminary proposal was a cost savings but more importantly, it also was an increase in the offering and the number of hours that the pool would be open. So based on that, and these things all happen in, in this room in budget workshops, so there's nothing going on in the back room. We were all sitting here talking about it and a lot of people saw it on, on TV because I got phone calls asking me what was going on. And then, so the last time around after the, the YMCA came in, we authorized them to make a more formal presentation to the council for consideration at some point in the future, not real soon, um, on that. And even though it would be operated by them, it would still be a city facility. It would be more of a management contract. It's kind of akin to, to uh, Mr. Pannoni down here who is doesn't actually work for the city. He's contracted for the city and um, saved us a bunch of money. Thank you very much. And so it's kind of along that line. And there's no final decision made. This is just um, way up at the beginning of the process, seeing how this can all work out. Did I do OK covering everything on that? OK. And who would like to be next? water aerobics class get up here and talk. I'm Jim McKenzie. Uh, I live up in uh, Mesa Oaks, but I participate in the uh, water aerobics, and uh, it really is a great class. I just want to add my support to uh, the current management there. Now, I understand, as I sit on another uh, legislative body, 
the importance of budget in these times. Uh, we're, we're talking really about one equivalent uh, full-time position. And the uh, current uh, manager that that facility has done a, a really fantastic job as far as the uh, operation of the uh, facility. As an engineer, I look at things that people don't see as far as how, it, how it's being maintained and how it's being operated. So uh, I can uh, only support the uh, current management and what they're doing. Uh, the, uh, all your metrics as far as over the years, the budget years are going so that they're gaining more and more income and less support from the city to support that beautiful facility. I am concerned, irrespective of what uh, the possibility the YMCA will do, uh, they don't have a pool here that they're operating. Their current management right now, I understand, I don't know the ind individual personally, but he spreads his time between here and San Inez. I'm just concerned that even though the uh, contracting out or whatever you want to call it, the operation of the pool, you're doing a good job now. Why screw up a good operation for one equivalent position? I understand what you have to do. I don't understand why you have to combine departments. All of those things are important in this time of very uh, tight fiscal restraint. But right now, you've got a good operation. You've got an excellent facility. All your metrics are going the right way as far as uh, more and more income. As far as additional offerings are concerned, uh, classes are concerned, uh, that's something I think that the existing management can do with support from the city. The, uh, I looked at the website for the YMCA uh, and their current openings. I hope our lifeguards are paid more than what they're paying. I personally looked at the website for the YMCA, and uh, I would not want to see our lifeguards that we have there now, even though they're part-time employees, be paid those wages. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next, please. Thank you. I'm Charles Broad, 400 North at G Street here in Lompoc. I'm a newcomer to the community. I've uh, been here almost two years now. In the many years of uh, service in the United States Navy and then in civilian life, I've lived in many communities, and Lompoc is unusually blessed to have a superb aquatic center, second to none. It's interesting that in the most recent AAA book, one of the features of Lompoc is our aquatic center. Not, uh, you don't see that in other places in the AAA book. Therefore, <clears throat> one has to ask, <clears throat> Has there been a decline in subsidy required, <clears throat> excuse me, from the city to run the aquatic center? <clears throat> Over the last five years, and I believe that these charts were submitted to council and the mayor. So I think you have these on record. <clears throat> so, to summarize quickly, <clears throat> over five years, from about 500,000, the uh, subsidy now is down to 210,000, demonstrating superb management by the current uh, aquatic supervisor, manager, uh, <clears throat> the uh, lifeguard training. <clears throat> the rehabilitation for people with disabilities such as myself has been superb. To see this facility turned over to the management 
of another agency seems uh, to require very careful consideration. If the chart was going the opposite way, one would have no argument. But with these statistics, uh, and uh, I don't have much time, <laughs> but if you compare it to other cities in this area, the allocation required from the city to support the aquatic center is less than any major one in the whole area. You can review these and know these. These are facts. Therefore, it would seem that, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor and Council, that very careful consideration needs to be given before we turn over what is a facility of the people to an outside agency. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Be assured we will. Hello, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is John Thermos. I'm a resident of the city of Lompoc. And I also have some opinion on, on the Lompoc Pool uh, Aquatic Center. Um, I'm also, uh, I really stress the importance of, of the independence that the city has by, by owning and maintaining the pool. I would hate to see them get rid of that independence they have and to give it to someone else and not really know where it's going, whereas, like the other gentleman said, statistically, we're seeing the reduction in, in costs and, the, uh, and it seems to be going in the right direction. So that's a really good thing. But the other thing I wanted to mention about the pool that has always disturbed me was that it was sold to the public be, before the vote as a, as a community asset that, that the community would be able to use um, at, at almost at their convenience. It was really sold like that. And we all... Many people that I know thought that, well, it probably be a lot like the city of Santa Maria pool. It's, it, the cost is $50 per family per year, and that's a very reasonable deal. It turns out that the city of Lompoc charges thousands of dollars per family per year, which is um, not very community friendly. And it basically has priced out a lot of people from even going to the pool maybe once or twice per year because of the uh, very, very high cost to it. And I'm just wondering if you did reduce the fee to, a, to more competitively to Santa Maria if the actual income from it might even be more than, than trying to uh, take such a high price per person where it, versus uh, being more family oriented and, and having a much lower cost that way. So I don't know if, that would, uh, if that's been uh, really studied, but I'm wondering if the cost per family is less than the overall impact would be more funds going to the city but we never really did realize that this was supposed to be a, a revenue um, uh, generated facility. It was, we thought it was, well, well, the city homeowners are paying for it, so it, it should be able to work out, it's, the, the cost should have it work out, but apparently you're trying to actually earn, make money on the pool. Uh, that's what my impression now is with the cost being so high. Um, when you're finished, I'll, I'll go off on that. That's all I want to say. Okay. Um, when, when the pool project started out, um, it had a substantially lower cost than the finished cost because it, um, it grew dramatically in the course from perhaps two pools to what it is now. Arguably, it is probably the finest aquatic center in California, surely the finest one in a town of our size. Unfortunately, the construction cost dramatically exceeded the revenue stream from the bond that I know I voted for and I'm pretty sure you voted for. Yes. And so as those costs increased, then we used redevelopment agency money. And that was also bond money and that's paid through uh, tax increment, which is the increase in value of those properties within the redevelopment area and the increase in those taxes and so I'm, I'm going to pull a number out of the air, but I think about two-thirds of the construction cost is actually paid for by redevelopment money, and we just chucked another million dollars worth of redevelopment money in there to, or million, million, no, it's not that, million four, for the dehumidifier to solve the problem that, mm -hmm. yeah, anyway. Um, so the above and beyond all of that, we have to operate it. And the bond issue 
um, provides a small amount for operation, but then the rest of that operation has to come from somewhere because the revenue, the income for it doesn't cover the cost of operation. And that's what the 200, it's actually $270,000 a year and we took $30,000 out of prior savings and bid this down to 240. So to say that it's very complicated would be a giant understatement. Um, I think I could probably spend two hours on this to get all the rest of you up to speed, um, just to catch up with where the five of us are. And what you need to know is that we're just looking at this as an alternative and no decisions have been made and we don't know at the end of the day if it's a good idea or a bad idea, it's just an idea. And you who know me very well know that I'm always looking at ideas. John and I have known each other for many years. Okay, so, thank you thank for your you, time. John. And next, please. Good evening, my name is Doris Forsey. I live in Mesa Oaks. And I'm here to talk on behalf of the Aquatic Center. And um, this Aquatic Center was a real grassroots effort and is now an attraction to the community. After only four and a half years of in existence, the pool is showing great potential for revenue expansion, such as swim meets, tourist attraction for Lompoc, and even therapeutic treatments. It is the only indoor facility in the area, making it more functional for more diversity. For example, winter activities inside from the elements, parties, social gatherings, and more. The success of the Aquatic Center is due to the professional expertise of those who operate it. Jeff Story, Tom Garcia, and team of lifeguards are irreplaceable. They run a tight ship. I enjoy swimming there six times a week, and I am part of those who keep the revenue coming in by actually using the facility. I, it would be a shame to lose such a remarkable place and turn it to, into a private facility such as the YMCA. I hope that you will leave the pool like it is and not sell it off to another operator. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And just so you know, it, we wouldn't sell it. It would just be a management contract. We would continue to own it, operate it, and direct how it was used. That you can be assured of. Hi, Ellen Thermos. And last time um, we were talking, uh, Councilwoman Costa had said, have you heard of the Splash Pass? I have heard of the Splash Pass, and I don't like it. I'll tell you why. Um, as a consumer point of view, this is the slant that I'm going to give you that I've swam all these years, and when the old pool was here, I swam. And so um, the situation with the Splash Pass actually is that it's an EFT. So if I decide that I'm working and I'm too busy to swim this month, I'm being debited and the money's being taken out. Now, some people say there's a hardship paperwork that you can go through. Well, that's a lot of extra work for me. I'm really not interested in that. And um, the other situation with the Splash Pass is not only would I not, as a consumer, be able to stop it at any time, I'm locked in for six months in that pass. It's just like the YMCA I told you last time, you probably don't remember that I grew up going to the Hitchcock Y. I swam all the time, my dad was an avid swimmer and that was something we did. And so I've been a member of the Y and I don't like to work out in the gym. I don't enjoy it, I only go for the pool. So um, San Ynez does have an awesome pool indoor. The thing I like about San Ynez that is consumer friendly opposed to Lompoc's Aquatic Center is the fact that they dedicate a single lane. At any time I can go in there if I'm a member of that Y and swim there. I think that's highly desirable and Lompoc should look into more flexibility. Even if it's just one lifeguard on and a couple lanes that one pool open for lap swimming because everybody's schedules are so diverse and just to try it temporarily for a few days, maybe 30 days and advertise it with the record. The other situation is I'm really not in favor of the Y taking over because what happens when you're not a member of the Y, they charge you $10 to go swim one time. It's too expensive. And the other, the other situation is with the YMCA, and I, I love the YMCA, I, it's a great organization. It's for elite, the rich, 
the middle class, upper middle class. It's not for the poor. And I do not, in spite of what I've heard tonight, believe that it would be anything different than that because I've grown up with them and I know the philosophy behind it. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, again, please hear me, the subsidy in Santa Maria Pool, $50 for a whole family to swim for a year. You know that I don't go to Santa Maria very often. When I was working as an interior decorator in Santa Barbara County, I would go all over. The Y would only allow me to swim at a pool. I had a job in San Inez that lasted 30, 30 days. I could only swim in the pool, um, let's see, what was it? It was 10 times and then I was kicked out, even though I was a member in Lompoc, and then I'd have to pay $10, even though I was paying my membership dues here. That's another thing I don't like about the Y. But um, the subsidy for Santa Maria, to get back to that, the $50 per year per family. A lot of people like me signed up for the Y. We never went to the Y. They got all of our money. We were locked up into a credit card thing, or not credit card, but the um, EFT thing. So they got a lot of money out of us and we never even used it. This is how this works in Santa Maria. If you get a lot of people in Lompoc to sign up and then you're getting the $50 per from family members. Now it's a first come first serve basis and some people might get mad if they're not able to swim, but I like that better. The 30 day uh, pass, which I purchase now because I swim, is a good idea except for one thing. If there are t a week where I cannot swim or don't want to swim, I'm not getting my money's worth as a consumer and I'm less likely to buy a pass or go to the y or go to the pool at all. I just quit going. And that's something that you guys should really look into too, is it should be, if I go one day, it's okay. The pass is good for the whole 30 days in my life, not month to month. Okay, thank you very much. And I know, you know, I know you guys are just looking into this, but there's a lot of negative things about letting anyone else take over the pool, not to mention the, the staff, the rehiring of staff. If you let them take over, then these good people that have been running the pool are gone. That would be difficult. Thank you. Next. Um, Mr. Mayor and council members, good evening. I'm Mary Saladino. I've been a resident in Lompoc for more than 40 years. And I have currently uh, been able to improve my health by going to the Lompoc swimming pool. My doctor loves it, my chiropractor loves it, and my physical therapist loves it. And it has made results. And not only is the swimming pool a great treasure to our community. It, well, it is a treasure. And as, as I s heard you say recently, Mayor, uh, that Lompoc is poor in money, but it is not poor in quality of people here. And so that's one thing I want you to understand is that the staff that you have at the Lompoc City Pool is excellent. They are certified and qualified um, professional people qualified for indoor and outdoor pool maintenance and care and the services that they provide are great and if you have a complaint about what is being offered if you would just go down and talk to them what your needs are they would probably they will provide a space for you then it would be continued as long as it is supported but uh, I know that there have been times when they have provided spaces for groups that wanted special attention or for their facilities, and then they found that people were not able to support it. And I think that is probably because of the economy that everyone is struggling with. And I don't think that our swimming pool staff should be penalized because our economy is bad. It's not their fault. And those people down there have been given a contract to be paid, and I'm hoping that they have benefits for what they have and perhaps some pensions that can, they can retire on someday. And those things are very important to family members, and it helps to speak to the quality of the community that you offer for us. So I want you to keep that in mind. And uh, it was also brought to my attention today that um, 
Not long ago, the um, YMCA staff asked our pool staff what kind of a budget they have or what kind of expenses that they have. And so the pool staff, being friendly, showed them every dime that they spend. And they were asking for a return to show us what you spend. They're still waiting for that. And I think it's very important for you to recognize the quality of what you have and the treasure that you have. And the people in this community voted for a facility for us to have as a swimming recreation area, a safe area, for our children to go and for our adults and our seniors. That long ramp that we have that is there, I see some of our seniors come with their walkers and their canes and even their wheelchairs. And they are rolled down that ramp into the warm water and then they are able to move through the water because you're buoyant. And the lifeguards are there. I've never seen anyone have to use one yet. But uh, our exercise leaders are excellent. And uh, you just need to recognize the treasure of what you already have, not what someone says they can do. And if they say they have all kind of pool experience, that may be true. But where are the local people in our community that can provide the same type of professional services that we currently have? Are they going to bring in someone from the outside who has qualified credentials perhaps? Or are we going to serve our community that we have? And also, um, oh well, I forgot. I'm sorry, my memory sometimes just goes. Oh, the triathlon. All of the water sports for the triathlon are sponsored by our Lompoc Aquatic Center, and you have people from all over the United, all over the state coming to attend. And I think they gave you a nice, tidy profit as a result of that. I had the figures here somewhere, but you could find out what they are. So please consider very carefully. What you have is wonderful. What we don't have is unknown. Thank you very much. You bet. Marilyn and council members, uh, my name is Daryl Tullis. Um, just a, a few things. First of all, I have a problem with the Y running, the uh, the uh, pool, if nothing more than for the fact that when they were initially talking about where the pool was going to be placed, the Y was in on those conversations and they offered a certain dollar figure, a very significant dollar figure, and they pulled out. I don't know what that reason was that they pulled out, but they did that. And um, I think that before any management is turned over to the Y, maybe we should ask them to consider putting that dollar figure back in and have them pay that before they before they get to manage the pool. Second of all, uh, I do believe that there is a certain amount of money that comes out of each household to pay for that pool. And I think that until that money is completely paid up, that um, the city should have to go to the residents and ask them if they want the Y to manage their pool. Um, the uh, third thing, I think that before we ask any one entity to manage the pool, we ought to offer that to two or three so that we have a choice. Uh, this city, um, um, we have often found ourselves in a position where council goes out and gets something going with a particular company, for instance, the water district, and what is brought back is one offer, and we're told that this is what we have to choose from, either what we have now or this one offer. And I think we need to stop doing that. We need to go out and get more than one thing that we can bid from or look at, and so we have something to compare it to. Um, and to keep this brief, the, the last thing, um, so you know, those are the things I uh, have to say about the pool. 
The last thing is when I came in, I heard a discussion on, and I was told I heard you say that we could talk about anything at this time. When I came in, I heard a discussion on term limits. And I think that where we are in our city right now, in our, in our government right now, we, you know, things are, are so tight as far as money goes um, that we have far more important things to be looking at than term limits. Um, I, I, you know, and I'm not picking on anybody. I don't know who brought it up. But I just think that um, I, I do remember hearing the mayor say that, you know, the, the electorate has a way of, of fixing term limits. When, uh, when we think you're not doing your job, we'll limit your term. <laughs> So anyway, um, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tellis. Would you pass these? Good evening. My name is Bob Doherty. I'm with American Star Tra Tra Transportation. I appeared before the council on May 17th, and I'm here to correct some of the things that were done during that meeting. Richard Fernbaugh returned to his office after the proposals were submitted on the 18th of April. While in his office, he opened the sealed proposals of the bidding. There was no public opening as required by both the FTA and the City of Lompoc Purchasing Manual. You have a very good purchasing manual. The City Council has approved this purchasing manual. This RFP completely shredded that manual. In response to the questions that Mayor asked of Richard Fernbaugh, Richard Fernbaugh made a false statement directed to the whole City Council. Richard stated the RFP Selection Committee had evaluated the RFP operation proposals, had interviewed, had interviewed the vendors, and then later opened the prices. I maintain that Richard Fernbar had the prices before he even went into the interview, and those were used to evaluate before he went in. On May 17th, I went before the City Council. I made the statement that the short-range transit plan is mandatory, is mandatory. Richard got up and told you that the plan is not required by the FTA. It's only a recommendation, and it's just a suggestion. If you refer to the first page of the, I turned, out, I turned over to you, that is in the short-range transit plan, page one of one. And it goes on to say, it is a federally mandated document providing the blueprint for the delivery of the public transportation system. The short-range short -range transit, transit plan serves as a primary justification for the receipt of federal and state funds that was supposed to be before the board tonight, and it's not here, and still it's almost four years late. You're taking federal funds without documentation of that use. It's a serious thing. Now, during the selection community evaluations, this is of the vendors that were interviewed, four of them, there's grave ethical violations were committed. Jim Moore, who works was a consultant for the city of Solvang, Richard and Kevin McCune finally requested that Moore, Jim Moore, send his documented matrix and his evaluations to them 29 days later after they met and interviewed people. We have no way of knowing if that's been recreated or tampered with. What is to say that the, excuse me, Jim Moore is and even what was so bad is Jim Moore was missing the critical scoring notes that he had on Ann Self, your project manager now, or, or will be on July 1st. And Kevin McCune lost his notes. So we've got inaccurate notes. We've got notes missing. And this is the evaluation they use to determine on who you're going to offer the award to the contract for you. Now, I, city, I protested the issuance of the contract on the evening of the 17th. After the council voted for it, I handed a copy to Stacy. And at that time, the council shouldn't have acted on it. You shouldn't have signed that contract under your own procurement manual. You signed the contract. You violated the, the process, process. You weren't told that, but you violated the process. I had a protest 
20 days ran under your actual, on your procedures manual. I have chosen to go before an administrative judge hearing. I deposited today $2,500 deposit that the city requires to pay for the administrative judge. So I'll oversee this, and then the judge will submit a report to the council. We have shown that, in fact, the RFP process was very flawed, and, and we've shown so many things that were wrong with to the staff. I believe the city of Lompoc should exercise our contractual right and serve store transportation with a 10-day notice to cancel their contract before July 1st. If store transportation is permitted to continue and begin their contract on July 1st, the cost of the city of Lompoc will be tenfold to get out of the contract. Right now, it's easy. After that date, you're going to owe a lot of money to store transportation. Now, let me tell you about a memo that was going to save you from all this embarrassment. The memo was written, or an email was sent from one to the other saying that... Mr. Mayor? Yeah. The time is up. Yeah. Could you wrap up, please, Bob? Yes, the email from Kevin to Richard said, let's delete the recommendation B. I don't think it makes sense to authorize Laurel to sign an optional year extension with American Star. Bef um, okay. Bob, I'm kind of concerned about this because it's an ongoing hearing issue. Is it in the documents you gave to us? It may have been. Okay. Yes. Should I collect them? I'd just like to leave it at that if you don't mind. Okay. Your, your time's up. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> and I will take a look at that procedure manual you rec that you re referenced. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council, Ralph Harmon. I wasn't going to speak about the pool thing this evening. However, may I save you some time because I was involved in the pool from day one. I was on the planning commission at the time, and there was a a lot of discussion about the why operating the pool back then. The, there was no public support, or virtually none, let's put it that way, to uh, allow the why to take over the operation of the pool. And so I think you're just going to be treading water, wasting time, you just get on with it and get on to some other things. <laughs> just put that aside because if you want to, or unless it's your intent to fill these chambers with uh, disgruntled citizens, do it. <laughs> but otherwise, I'd forget it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Hi, my name is Rob Smith. <clears throat> Since we could talk about anything, I want to just kind of go back to the uh, term limits. Our government was formed from the beginning of our nation as a citizen government. It was never envisioned that there would be a ruling or political class who managed to stay in power over the people for tens of years, be it at the national, state, or local level. And because people are somewhat lazy, and because there's oftentimes things that get on and get in, involved in the way, and we can look at just by voting percentages, the few people that even register to vote, much less actually vote, we realize that there's oftentimes a lack of participation. So the same people stay in power for a long time. And because of this, we tend to vote for the status quo. Sometimes it works out good, but primarily it leads to stagnation in government at best and corruption at worst. Lompoc has been fortunate to avoid the serious corruption that has plagued other cities in California, but we have not escaped stagnation in our civic leadership. And this is one of the main reasons we need term limits. It causes us to regularly infuse the city government with new blood and new ideas. To those of you who claim that we might send good leaders packing, I say everyone is replaceable, and if a leader is really good at what they're doing and leading, they will have inspired and provided for the agenda to continue after their departure. We will not suffer under term limits, rather we will surely gain. So I would encourage you to really look at it as a form of citizen government to really help us to continue what, what the Founding Fathers looked at. And we can look at our own presidential, the, the office of president, and realize how important this is. And I think every one of us can think of Congress people and senators that we really don't like and we wish they would move out of the way. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Going, going, gone. Okay. 
And now we'll move on to the consent calendar and then we'll take a break. And this evening on the consent calendar, we have approval of the minutes, approval of expenditures, approval of a resolution designating certain streets for permit parking during the Flower Festival, approval of a resolution closing portions of H Street and Ocean Avenue for the 2011 Flower Festival Parade, approval of a resolution transferring unclaimed property, and these are small amount checks that have been uncashed, a memorandum of understanding with the employees represented by the Lompoc City Firefighters International Association, closing portions of Ocean Avenue and H Street for the Lompoc High School Alumni Cruise Night, July 1st, coming up, and a response to the 2010-2011 Santa Barbara County Civil Grand Jury, and this deals with um, coordinated response and also with the um, ability to deliver information to the people in an emergency situation and grew out of some of the issues in the South County for, for, for fires. Um, I'm sorry, who was first? Councilmember Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just had two edits for the meeting minutes from May 17th. Okay. The first is uh, open session. It says 6 colon 3 instead of 6.30 p.m. There's a zero missing there. And then also on page 5 of 7, uh, the break, it says at 8.15, we took the break, and at 9.26, we reconvened. And I wish we would have taken over an hour break, but I don't <laughs> think we did. So um, that either needs to be 9.15 to 9.26 or 8.15 to 8.26, whichever is uh, correct. Please have that changed. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody remember which one it was? Yeah. I believe we should have Councilmember Costa watch, watch tape and let us know. <laughs> I'm more than happy to do that. <laughs> Councilmember Lingle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I will be... Uh, voting to support and the consent calendar, but I'd like to make a comment on one of the items prior to us voting on it, and that is um, item number nine, the response to the 2010-2011 Santa Barbara County Civil Grand Jury. It was a, it was a good, good staff report and went into a lot of detail, and it, also, it addressed the reverse 911 system that we have in place for the city of Lompoc and Santa Barbara County. <laughs> Recently, when we had the tsunami warning here in Lompoc, it became evident to me, and a lot of people were concerned about if, there, if the reverse 91 is in effect, how do we use it with our cell phones? Many people do not have landlines anymore. And I had a discussion with our police chief today. The 911 system is still in effect. The city no longer operates it. It's through the county of Santa Barbara, but you still can register your cell phones to get notification in the 911, in the reverse 911. So if you want, and police chief will correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you just call the County of Santa Barbara Fire? Emergency police? Response Center. Emergency Response and register your cell phone. And in the event of an emergency, your cell phone will receive the reverse 911 warning. So I just wanted to make that comment for the public. Thank you. Are there any other comments on the regarding consent calendar? I'd accept an a motion to accept the consent calendar as amended. Uh, I don't know who was first. Go ahead. Councilmember Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, with the edits of the minutes, I move to approve the consent calendar. And a second, please. I second. It's been moved and seconded to accept the consent calendar. Is there any other discussion at this time? Seeing none, could we vote, please? And that passes 5-0. And I took too many notes, and I'm running out of writing paper. So we will take a seven-minute break. Uh, make it seven minutes and 50 seconds. Go for the big time. And we'll be right back. OK, our next item will be a public hearing for consideration of a Planning Commission recommendation for a text amendment to the City's Zoning Ordinance to amend Section 
definitions and section 70 yeah, anyway signs allowed by permit in condition okay commercial and industrial zones and making the presentation our own Lucille Breeze thank you thank you mr. mayor good evening good evening council members uh, this is a recommendation from the Planning Commission as the mayor indicated regarding wayfinding signs the recommendation is that the council receive and review the Planning Commission recommendation hold the public hearing adopt the negative declaration prepared for the text amendment and direct staff to file a notice of determination waive further reading and introduce ordinance number 1575 parens 11 approving text amendment TA 1101 amending the city zoning ordinance section 17.108.020 definitions and section 17.108.070 Zero seven zero signs allowed by permit in commercial and industrial zones the Planning Commission held a series of hearings on this particular text amendment and the information is included in your staff report copies of the Planning Commission agenda I'm sorry um, resolution that was adopted and the minutes from the meetings to uh, keep you informed of the Planning Commission discussion for the particular item the Planning Commission recommendation as I said is to recommend or to approve this uh, particular text amendment and um, that concludes my staff report and I'm available for any questions in the in a nutshell would you summarize what kind of signs these are yes sir these signs are signs and you may have seen them we ha do have some temporary ones that are in existence right now they are generally a sign that is approximately 10 feet tall and they identify a specific business or group of businesses that are similar in nature they are meant to be uh, directional so that someone seeing these signs would be directed to a certain location where these signs are con or where the businesses are concentrated the Planning Commission went through a great deal of discussion and has refined the ordinance to um, make the signage uh, consistent for one industry and to have the signs located in a certain area and for them to be um, architecturally similar so that the uh, signs are pleasing and hopefully not distracting or causing any type of a traffic. Uh, impact so these are wayfaring signs in nature that would direct you and um, in the case of the ones that we have currently the, they direct people to the various wine industry areas of town downtown the wine ghetto etc correct okay and the ordinance isn't structured in such a way so that we won't have sign pollution because there's a limited number that can be put up as my planning commissioner told me and they have to be aesthetically pleasing but they don't necessarily have to have hanging baskets no that was uh, just an attractive attra addition yes okay thank you very much and I'm sorry who was first council member uh, real quick question if the city wanted to put up way signs is this ordinance conducive to that Way signs to City Hall, to police, to museum, to library. Uh, those are a different type of governmental sign. What if we wanted to match those? That could certainly be done. Councilmember Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, on these uh, wayfinding directional signs, can it have the specific business's name? Or, uh, for example, uh, in the wine industry, they did not use any business names. They used general um, names. That's correct. They chose to uh, actually have a location. And if you'll <clears throat> look at the sign, it actually gives you the copy is um, include a reference to an area or group of businesses so you would be able to have a business on there so you could have a, a specific business name mm -hmm. 
So that means that a specific business could be identified identified or it, you know in some sense of the word have some publicity in a public right of way that's correct okay I'm first of all gonna say I don't think that that's the right way to go in that regard I think that we shouldn't allow specific business names to go on these uh, my second question is um, uh, and this is probably for city attorney as well uh, this is not limited to any industry this could essentially be any grouping of businesses regardless that's correct. It's a concentration of a certain type of business. Right. And that was my other, that leads into my next question, which is. That's for the distance between. The distance between is 1,000 feet. Ah. Well, that is within <clears throat> the same grouping. Now, you said that it, your commissioner told you it wouldn't be, there wouldn't be too many, but that's within each single business grouping. So one group couldn't probably wouldn't have too many signs in the same area, but if you're getting too many groups, there could be then an issue with well, too much signage. The so the, um, the question, as I understand it from my conversation was, if business group A put a sign here, the next closest one would have to be a thousand feet away or roughly three city blocks? That is correct. Okay. okay. So no one, if, if you were here with the wine sign, no one else could put one there, nor could anyone put with one within a thousand feet. Right. So the number of potential locations that's left is relatively small. But I'm, I'm thinking worst case here, if you have multiple industries in town who think that this is a good idea, which it is, I do support the wine signs, I think they're great. Um, the issue could be that you could have a sign essentially every three city blocks. And that to me is extremely excessive. I don't want to see our town scattered with wayfinding signs throughout H Ocean, you know, Central, and then within a quarter mile of that location. That is a concern of mine. But the question that I had um, more generally, which is the wayfinding directional signs means an off-premise sign along the path of travel directing potential patrons to an area in which multiple businesses of the same type are located and to businesses within that area. So my concern is, is what is an area? You know, it, does it mean, you know, for the wine ghetto, it's, it's very clear we're all within one industrial complex and it's sort of, it's nice little neat little box. But an area, if you're just saying the word area, is that five city blocks? Is that a, a mile? Is that a, a, you know what I mean? So that is up for interpretation and I think could cause an issue. So it's just something else I wanted to bring up as a question. If there was any discussion um, amongst staff why this term was used, I think that having some leeway is good. I'm just afraid this is a little too broad. There was discussion at the uh, Planning Commission regarding this and with staff and generally what you're looking at is a concentration of business so it would be in a, a general area. We didn't want to be too, too specific to say within one block because it could limit the, um, the participation. So we did want to say a general area okay. and allow some flexibility. Okay. I mean, you know, with Lompoc being rather small, uh, that would be my, you know, to say a general area, you know, maybe it's the north side of Lompoc. Is that considered a general area because it's all on the north side? And I'm not sure if that is considered enough of a, a concentration to be considered an area. And so that was just sort of my concern that I wanted to discuss this evening. I also wanted to point out um, to council really quickly um, on the minutes, just to note, because I noticed this and I Usually when we get a recommendation from the Planning Commission, if it's a 5-0, it's very easy for us to, to support that decision. In this case, you had two uh, members recuse themselves, one say no, so this is really only two Planning Commissioners who sent this forward. Just wanted to give a heads up to that. Thank you. Um, sorry, I don't know who's next. Cecilia, I'm sorry, Councilmember Martner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have a couple of concerns with this. Uh, one is the fact of a line, uh, private business, um, have a sign on a public right of way. So if, is there any, I mean, I, I think I heard you say that a business could have their name, not a business type. So we need to clarify that. A business type like the Lompoc Wine Ghetto or the Lompoc Wine Trail, but it's not a uh, Loring Wine Company <laughs> or Flying Goat or whatever, right? Um, 
Are we saying that we are going to allow a business type or a particular business to be named in this way signs? A particular business would be allowed to have their name on the sign. The signs that are up right now say the wine trail and then they do indicate the area but if they had chosen to come in with specific wineries that were in that area that would have been allowed okay so um, I you know I have some issues with that um, again also with the area um, what is considered an area it will be dependent on the type of business if we are talking about that the you know the car dealers in town get together and they say we're going to ask for um, putting a sign, you know, car dealers come to Lompo, here we are. Now, that's a huge area because their lots are big, right? If you want to have, you know, uh, whatever, uh, car mechanics uh, do this. So, so I think we need to be specific of what type of, uh, you know, what is it that we're after here? I mean, we, you know, we went to this because of the Lompo wine trail. I think everybody agrees that was a good idea to make it happen. We had to go and write this, but now we're opening ourselves to, I think, potential issues. Right? Councilmember, am, am I misinterpreting oh, sorry. this or no? If I may, through the mayor, the reason that the language that's being suggested in the code is being suggested in in not identifying one particular um, business area is because if you if the city did that you would likely open yourself up to um, having a challenge that that kind of a restriction isn't a valid use of your zoning authority the city can't restrict signage because of first amendment rights based on content you can restrict them based on um, other criteria but not based on the content of the actual business that you're focusing on so if indeed you approved a, a uh, set of standards that said only wine businesses or only the wine ghetto would be permitted to have off-site signs someone who wanted to challenge that would uh, most likely be successful in that challenge and either have that thrown out and then you wouldn't have any signs or they would say I also have an area that's um, of some multiple similar uses and that should also be authorized to have a sign and that's why this was worded the way it is it's not any business it's and it's not any using your example it's not any place a car sales operation operates it has to be in a certain geographical defined area where there's more than one auto sales happening if that were to happen then yes those could those, that group of businesses could also have a wayfinding sign the businesses in the north end of town that are a shopping center because those are similar businesses that they're retail they could have a wayfinding sign to that shopping center Just to add a little clarification, um, where do these signs have to be placed? Uh, the or for the ordinance, the location is within one foot you know, within the property line, and they are um, in, an encroachment permit would be required if they were located on public property. Uh, if they're on private property, uh, the property owner's permission would be necessary. They may only be located on Ocean, H, and Central, or within one quarter mile of the main road to the business in a commercial or industrial zone. And as to the public property, this ordinance doesn't mandate that signs have to be put in public property. If someone wanted to put a sign in public property, the city has to agree to that. They can't, they don't have a right to put it there. And the other side, side of this is of all of the signs that were placed for the wine ghetto, can you tell me how many were placed on public property? I believe there's only one. And approximately how long did that process take? 
uh, that was issued for the, the signs to be permitted? No, just for the process for that one sign. Oh, it was issued under a temporary use permit, so it was issued quite quickly, within a week. And that was on city property, correct? That's correct. Okay. And if it had been Caltrans property, how long would you think that would take? Um, Caltrans encroachment permit could take a substantial amount of time. Kind of like a flagpole and orchid, huh? <laughs> yeah. So the other thing to remember with this is that of the three streets listed, two of them are Caltrans property. And so putting something in the Caltrans right of way, I recall when we tried to get a, what does it say, tourism information sign when I was on the chamber board. I think it took two and a half years on an existing pole, and we had to pay for it. So it's not a um, go put one up process. Councilmember Lingle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, I kind of wish we would spend this much time on the feather signs or the flutter signs we have around town, but maybe that's a subject for another time. Um, the signs are, we've been discussing economic development for the last year, and these signs really are a sign of our progress in economic development. That's what these signs are for. They're, yes, to advertise the businesses in the area, but our economy right now, a good portion of it, is in the wine industry. So I'm very happy that we are taking this step towards economic development in this industry. The other thing I just want to mention is the concerns that we're bringing up tonight, they are all good, legitimate concerns, but they were thoroughly discussed at the several planning commission meetings. They did have legal representation during those meetings, and I'm satisfied that with the attorney that was sitting in there giving them advice that the concerns that they had are the concerns we have this evening that they've been addressed over and over again and I'm I think that what we see here tonight is a fine a final product of many people getting together with many minds and coming up with a good product so thank you thank you councilmember Costa <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, is the sign on the entrance of 246 and Highway 1 the one sign that's located on public property from the for the wine trail? At, um, the one in front of Home Depot? Correct. <coughs> that one is on, uh, on Home Depot property. The one at the airport is the one. But that one is the one by the city where the sign by the city of Lompoc. City of, don't right. we all? That's Home Depot property? Mm -hmm. Oh, it is. Okay. Well, then there's nothing I can say about that. I really don't like that one there. But, you know, if it's public property, then, you know, that's okay. Um, I, uh, but I wanted to get back to the, uh, the private property. I don't even think that uh, with a permit should uh, a business be entitled to put a sign with their name on it on public property. That, to me, seems silly. The other question I had for staff and the last question before co public comment for me is, um, an, another issue with the statement that I read earlier is we say the word multiple businesses. So the word area is very vague. Multiple businesses, again, what does that mean? Is that two or more? Is that three or more? How, what, what signifies multiple businesses? It would be more than two. More than two. So two or more or three or more? More than two, three. Okay, three or more. Okay, because that doesn't, does that say that anywhere? Or am I, did I miss that? Uh, no, but certainly language could be included. Right, okay. Um, I'd be more comfortable with definitely with stating that because finding two businesses that are that are like close to one another um, actually I think would be rather easy and that's a concern of mine. So thank you. Um, okay, let's let's take a break here and we'll go to public comment. Who would like to speak on this subject? And I know you can clarify who's on public property. Hi, good evening, Council. Jason Reynolds. Um, I, you know, I've really just wanted to kind of come up and thank everyone for this process and um, a full year of uh, the city council, uh, many different departments of the city employees, uh, the volunteers, the businesses, and the Lompoc Planning Commission. Uh, they spent a lot of time uh, going and making sure that this was put together correctly. Um, we've spent some time with the wineries over the last couple months, and they've all mentioned uh, the, the, the effectiveness of these. Um, you know, our ghetto is, is placed in an area that has some residentials. 
that uh, you know when folks are coming in and they're not sure where the Lompoc Wine Ghetto is, they're they're missing it. They're bypassing it, and um, they've really said that that's been a huge help, uh, just getting traffic into these areas and uh, keeping it, you know, the area a little bit safer. Uh, I you know clarification of any of the issues that are out there, um, just with in, in regards to you know private public property, uh, you know the 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 corner of of the Lompoc at 246 and one is a very complicated corner. You just have uh, Kevin McCoon uh, print that 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 out for you, and, and and it's some slivers that the city owns that are right there. But then there's some other pieces that that Home Depot owns, and it was just in everyone's best interest that they were kept on private property. So that's uh, why we kept it in that in that area. But yeah, you're right. I'll, if you look at it, you'll realize. I mean, it's it's feet away from it really almost being in, in the city's property. So that's why maybe well, there's some confusion there. But if there's any other questions, but I don't have anything else to say. Thank you. Any questions for the expert? Nope. Okay. Thanks. Oh. Wait, go ahead. Come back. Come back. Hey, Jason, uh, just a real quick question. Uh, yeah. Hey, would you be willing to take on city way signs now? You know, absolutely. I mean, anything that um, can come our way. I mean, as you know, I know, Dirk, we've spoken about that a little bit, and I've looked at other towns and seen other examples of that. And, uh, you know, we've, I, I've been told a lot by people that, it, you know, it, it throws some charm into our town and just that a little bit of, you know, uniqueness. And uh, I think there's no reason why our museums and our aquatic center and, you know, all those different, you know, high points in our town couldn't also somehow be played into this. Thanks. Thank you. George Bedford, Long Polk resident, long time. George, George, do you have your speaker's card? Do what? Do you have your speaker's card? And no, we we don't normally them. insist on speakers' cards, but in your case, I'm willing to make an exception. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I certainly do appreciate that. Thank you, George. Uh, just uh, just a couple of comments on I, we don't have an issue with too many signs in this town. We have an issue with too few businesses. And the more you start restricting people coming into town, we, we need the, the city. And, and and trust me, with you five up here, things have made a major turn with people from outside's attitude towards Lompoc. So I want to give you kudos for that. But it's not a matter of too many signs. It's a matter of too many businesses. And trust me, signs are supposed to be a distraction. I know we've, we hear that up here, but the bottom line is it's a sign. It's supposed to distract people and let them know that something else is going on. Obviously, we're supposed to be able to multitask while we're driving, but the signs are going to be a distraction. So it's something, but we still have too few businesses here, and we need to concentrate on fixing that issue before we worry about the issue of having too many signs in town. You can always borrow a chainsaw from me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak on this subject? Seeing no one rise, we'll come back to council and council member Cox. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I'm definitely having... Um, an issue here because the chamber did it right there's there's no question the chamber did it right but my concern about this um, this ordinance is that this allows for too many opportunities to do it wrong and I want to ensure that it, it isn't done wrong and I do believe the Planning Commission did go through this as Councilmember Lingle stated um, and they vetted it quite a bit but I'm not um, sure that uh, I'm on board with you wholeheartedly simply because only two of the five really are what sent this forward. So um, there was a lot of discussion amongst three, two decided um, to pass as is. So I'm not um, fully on board with, with just following through with what the Planning Commission has brought forward to us. So again, just that that's my concern and I wanted to restate that. Thank you. What specific issues are you concerned about? Maybe we can make change, a, do a little wordsmithing and solve your concern. Um, oh, well, there's there's multiple. The issue of the um, word area, um, obviously the, the text change from multiple businesses to three or more. Um, I don't believe that a specific business's name should be allowed in a public on public property. Um, and I know that that would require an, encro an encroachment permit. So maybe we can add language as to um, it not allowing the encroachment permit if the signage includes the name of the specific business. Um, I honestly would rather have um, businesses do it the way the chamber did, which is where there's no specific business name um, at all. Um, but that's just my opinion on that. 
You were too fast. Go back. We had three or more. No specific business names. What was the one I missed? Um, no, uh, area. 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 Okay. And then also um, encroachment permits should not be given to signage that has business names. Yeah, I got that. Specific business names included. Okay. Um, you know, and, and again, I, I just, I'm thinking worst case here. I don't want to say that, you know, businesses will abuse this by any means. Um, but I just want to make sure that we're not, um, you know, dealing with unintended consequences later on down the line. Thank you. And just to make sure I remember correctly, these still have to have a planning commission approval or they have a staff approval. The recommendation was to council and the council can accept that recommendation. No, no, I mean, once this, once we pass something and someone wants to put one of these signs up, what is the approval process? Oh, I'm sorry. The approval process, once the ordinance is adopted, would be a staff level administrative review. Okay. And I'm sorry, I didn't know who was next. Councilmember Martner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't have as many issues as Councilmember Costa has, uh, but I do have one. Um, I would like to restrict these way signs to a business type, um, not to a specific business name. And, and I'm doing so because I think we're really endangering our city in having a litter with a lot of signage. And yes, signages are good, but once they become um, once they become all over the place, you're really talking about a very unattractive city. And uh, that goes against economic development, really. <laughs> so it's always in, um, I think it's always in, I'm sorry, is? No, I thought. Okay. Um, I think it's always about a question of balance. I think um, the signs that are there right now for the type of business, the wine business, are excellent, and they're doing the job that they were supposed to do. I think uh, if there are other businesses, types, that would like to do so, um, I would also think that we should allow them. But to move on from business types to specific businesses, I think we're really uh, going to open ourselves to really litter the town with a lot of signage. So that's, um, you know, I would go with this if we just specifically uh, limit it to business types. Um, City Attorney, would we, would we face any difficulty if we did not allow specific business names? No, not at all. Okay. Yeah. No, he's, he's saying we can, we can do it. I know. What was the issue earlier? It was, yeah. Okay. What, I was saying, in, what, what I was saying is we can't only allow them right. for the wine ghetto. Yeah, have to, it has to be open, but it did, would not have to allow a specific business name. Correct. And I have the same concern about um, basically they would be considered off-site signs, and they're allowed under certain very strenuous conditions now where a business is at the way down a driveway and has a back set. Um, so that's available for someone under the current ordinance. Uh, yeah, I agree. I don't think we should have specific businesses. Council Member Lingle. Mr. Mayor, with your indulgence, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask Jason Reynolds to come back up and just address that issue um, about specific businesses. Um, on specific businesses, we, again, we, we decided that that wasn't the way that we wanted to go. Um, we do plan on, um, uh, you know, down the road developing an entire plan for the wine ghetto with an actual signed program that will include the actual specific businesses. Um, we were not, uh, you know, it wasn't a wasn't a concern of ours to really get people in to help them find con certain businesses. We're, we're getting them in for the industry. So as you speaking for the Chamber of Commerce, you would have no problem with us making this? Oh, absolutely not. No, I think that's, um, that's right in line with what our intentions of the whole program are. Okay, thank you. And with regard to the issue of the area, if, can you recommend a wording to um, add three or more? To, to do the three or more, I would just suggest amending, changing the word multiple in the two times that it appears and just have it say three or more rather than multiple. Okay. 
And with regard to the, if the council wants to do that, with regard to not having the signs be able to identify a particular business, just strike the words and to businesses within that area in the two locations that that okay. occurs. Everybody good with that? Are there any other issues that anyone sees? <laughs> Councilmember Costa? Um, again, I want to get back to, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to get back to the um, encroachment permit. I don't think that we, um, well, I guess if we're eliminating the idea of having this. There's no name, name on there, yeah. yeah. And we'd be okay with putting yeah. signs on public property? Yeah. As long as it's just industry based. Okay, definitely, I see that, and that makes sense. Um, but then, so just the idea of area, again, is if we say the north side, you know, you got, you know, you, you use, you know, west side area, you know, so it's like, okay, they're, they are, I, they're pretty close to one another. Um, but, you know, can somebody say, well, all, all four of our businesses are located, you know, north of ocean, you know what I mean? Is that considered an area? I'm just a little concerned about that. So if, does anybody have any suggestions on how to deal with that as an issue? Do we have a definition in the, in the code for area? I kind of doubt it. Is there a um, city attorney? Could you select, perhaps recommend, a um, word for a smaller area, <laughs> based on your vast years of experience? One one suggestion I would have is the community development director, the planning manager, have authority to interpret the the code, and I know that they're listening to what the council's saying. So my suggestion would be is since this would be a new ordinance. Let's see what comes to them in terms of people requesting it. And if they start getting a lot of requests that are not meeting the intent that you're describing, then we come back and change the wording rather than change it now because, I mean, we certainly can do that. I would, rec I would rec if you want to do that, I would suggest you not try to do that wordsmithing tonight. Let us have a chance to think about it and come back to you at the next meeting with the ordinance introduced. Um, no, I just soon move this one down the road. I uh, guess, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, yeah. I just interrupt. I'm, not, I, um, I'm actually more comfortable with them coming back than making it indefinite and just seeing who applies. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with that. I just want to let that be seen tonight, or then you know, or a follow-up meeting, but n no farther than that. Okay. Um, Councilmember Starbuck. The area is going to be zoned for whatever they're trying to direct people there. So if it's zoned for industry and they're using it as a wine ghetto, that zoned area would be the area. It would be clearly defined. It would be just like the, the west side. It's going to be just like anything else. They're not going to direct people to residential. It's zoned industrial. They've turned it into a wine ghetto. That whole zoning would be the area. Yeah. Or commercial. No. Mr. Mayor, if it's zoned commercial and, you know, you, sit, you, you know, a group of retailers, for example, could use this sign program, you know, you have commercial spaces all over to the north side of town. So that then allows that area to be the entire north side of town. So they have a sign that says retailers. <laughs> well, I, I think that we definitely limited the possibility by taking the name out. I, I, I agree. However, I'm just... I'm just throwing it out there that the word area is very vague. I guess I'm willing to give area a shot. <clears throat> I'm, I want to. So what I would like, if somebody would be willing, would be a motion to accept the ordinance with the change, the two changes that our city attorney recommended, one to change multiple to three or more, and the other to eliminate the wording which would allow the name of an individual business to be um, on it. Councilmember Martin. Uh, if the council is ready to us, uh, take a motion, I will make the motion that we, um, where are we, sorry. Uh, that we accept the consideration of the Planning Commission recommendation for the tax amendment to the City Zoning Ordinance to amend Section 17.108.020 definitions uh, of signs allowed by permitting commercial and industrial zones with the two amendments that this Council has made, um, that they will be restricted to business types and not specific businesses and that it will be restricted to, or it would be a minimum of three 
businesses that would be allowed to apply for this way ordinance. And um, will you move the, uh, the adopt the negative declaration also, please? Do we have to in the motion? Um, so so with, let's do it, okay? Adopt the negative declaration as well as part of the motion. And a second, please. I'll go ahead and second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to adopt this ordinance as amended. Um, is there any other discussion before we vote? <laughs> Councilmember Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Council Members, for entertaining my discussion. Um, I appreciate the changes that we've made, and uh, because I think that uh, the majority of what I requested has been changed, I will be voting in favor. I just want to say thank you. Yeah. My favorite phrase, all good things. Um, is there any other discussion? Seeing none, could we vote, please? And that passes 5 0. And the next item this evening is the approval of resolution 55722 sub 11, the city of Lompoc appropriation limits for fiscal year 2011-2012. And Mr. Wilkie has assured me that if we pass this $31 million appropriation limit, he will bring the money next week. I wish it was working that way, but that's not <laughs> really the intent of this action. Um, Honorable Mayor, Council Members, uh, the voters in 1979 and again in 1990 voted on a couple of pr propositions to make a uh, finding by each and every um, governmental entity in California to do a public action to set a limit for the preparations for the coming year. Um, that is happening right now. The preparation limit is based on a formula that was set up in those two propositions back in the 70s and 90s, uh, and is based primarily on um, cost of living, either through the CPI or the a California identified increase in um, income. And it's also based on population changes either within the county overall or the city, whichever is more advantageous for the, for the city. In our particular case, we've chosen the growth of income for the state that has been published. And this year, the Department of Finance, which will probably be the last year that's done as a interim between um, the census times, um, shows that the city had a increase in population of a 0.18 percent while the county overall actually lost population so we chose to use the city population for our calculation the practical effect of this is to limit what we can spend the the reality is is that our ability to spend the money that we have is based on how much we actually are taken in and that dollar amount is substantially less than its appropriation limit and so we have to live within our means uh, so this appropriation limit in some respects is um, a formality that we have to go through because of the vote um, our appropriation limit is in excess of 31 million dollars um, what's proposed for the 11 12 budget is approximately um, 14 million dollars it's subject to this limit so that differential is um, lost opportunity, but had we received more revenues or expected to get receive more revenues in some other universe, if we actually received $50 million, we'd still be limited to the, the $31 million. So this is a request to adopt the GAN limit as proposed. Um, the staff report itself was published on the website approximately 10 days ago. It has been at the library for um, for review, and if you have any questions regarding this, I am happy to answer them. But this is the that's the result of my staff report, and I'm here to answer questions. So basically, to summarize, this is a legal requirement from the state that has absolutely no effect on us because we don't have this much money. 
and the state's primarily or the reason for that because of ERAF. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> ERAF. That would be the money they stole from us. Okay, any questions from the council? Um, I think it's unlikely, but is there anyone in the public who would like to speak on this subject? Seeing no one, ah, George, he started to move. Um, seeing no one rise, we'll bring it back to council for, I hope, a very quick approval. Um, Councilmember Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move the approval of resolution number 5722, Prenz 11, City of Lompoc's appropriation limits for fiscal year 2011 2012. And a second, please. I second. And now, if there's any further discussion. Seeing none, could we vote, please? And surprisingly, it passed 5 0. <laughs> Thank you, and we'll be back to this again this time next year. Thank you. So you're you're not bringing in the money tomorrow like you, okay. Well, you know, we can hope. Okay. Um, the next item is the approval of the engineer's report confirming um, the diagram and assessment and ordering the levy of assessment for fiscal year 2011-2012 for the Park Maintenance and City Pool Assessment District. It has come to my attention that um, when this was posted on the website and also distributed to the council members that the actual report was not distributed, although it was attached to the May 5th council meeting. And um, I personally would not be able to pass this this evening. However, we do have a noticing requirement, and what I recommend is that we begin the public hearing, take comment from the audience that's here, continue the item to our next council meeting. In the meantime, the actual report will be posted for everybody to look at, um, and then we can take a final act. Excuse me, we can take a final action on it at that council meeting and my conscience will be clear and we have no time problem with putting this off for one week or for two weeks other than that we want to hold this hearing because of the noticing requirement. We don't want to go back and start that all over again. And uh, I will take questions from council before we go forward. Councilmember Lingle. Mr. Mayor, at the next regular scheduled meeting, you would again take public comment? Yes. Though. Okay. This, this would be a continued item. We would just begin it here and finish it there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and that would, would satisfy our noticing requirement. And now our Parks, Recreation, and Urban, <laughs> Urban Forestry, it's really a tough tongue tonight, <laughs> Director, Mr. Dan McCaffrey. Good evening, Mayor, uh, Council, members of our audience, and those viewing from home. A little background. On May 3rd of this year, Council approved Resolution 5715, Para 11, which was a resolution of the city's intention to levy assessments for fiscal year 2011-12, giving preliminary approval of the engineer's report and providing notice of a public hearing for the Park Maintenance and City Pool Assessment District number 2201 for the fiscal year 2011-12. Uh, the engineer's report proposed a budget and assessments provide revenue for that budget. It also set June 7th, which is tonight, uh, as the date for the public hearing at which the City Council would determine whether to continue with the assessments. The public hearing was noticed by publication in the law book record on May 27th of 2011. At tonight's meeting, uh, Council is holding the said public hearing for the proposed continuation of the assessments for the Park and Maintenance City Pool Assessment District 2002-101, excuse me, in order to receive any public input on the proposed continuation of the assessments, the proposed assessments of the budget for fiscal year 2011-12, and the services and improvements funded by the assessments and any other issues related to the assessments. In order to uh, continue to levy the assessments, on March 15th of this year, the City Council directed SEI Consulting Group the assessment engineer to prepare an engineer's report for this coming fiscal year. The engineer's report, which includes the proposed budget for the assessment 
and the updated proposed assessments for each parcel in the city was completed and filed with the city on April 12th of, of this year. The proposed assessments for fiscal year 2011-12 are 2430 per single family equivalent benefit unit and the total amount of revenues that would be generated by the assessment in fiscal year 2011-12 is approximately $282,609. The proposed assessment of 2.19% does not exceed the previous year's assessment by more than the property owner's approved increase of 3% per year. As stated by the mayor, it is recommended that the council hold a public hearing on the proposed continuation of the assessments and uh, after uh, any public comment tonight, would continue the discussion, any actions to a future meeting. Um, with that, our consultant and the uh, engineer of record tonight, Mr. John Bliss from SCI is with us as well as city staff and we're here to answer any questions. With that, that concludes my report. John, would you like to come up and say a couple words? And I'm dying to know, after all these years of listening to this, why we have an engineer to study a financial matter. I know there's an explanation. Fantastic. Members of the City Council, um, staff, and members of the public, my name's John Bliss. I'm a civil engineer with a company called SCI Consulting. And we do Prop 218 benefit assessments up and down the state. Let me respond to your question first because I get it all the time. Essentially, as I understand it, assessments started here in California. They first started in Roman times, but they started here um, when we did a lot of levy work in the Central Valley, this idea of an assessment on property. At that time, surveyors were held in high esteem, as were civil engineers. They were held in very high esteem in our community. In fact, most counties had a county elected um, surveyor. And the idea was a surveyor, this idea we think of parcels and property is well defined, everyone knows what it is. But at the time it was kind of a new concept and the surveyor would be the best at evaluating the value of a property as well as the, the, how the property was laid out. Surveying and civil engineering were very similar at the time. So it's my understanding, and I, I like California history, as you can probably tell, that the, the law was created because the civil engineer at that time was well suited to determine this, this, this abstract concept is if there is special benefit um, conferred on that property by this improvement. For, for flood control, it's very easy because you can build a levy and clearly there's special benefit in all, by conferred on all the properties within that ring levy, for example. In your case, um, I'm happy to um, report here to the City Council that your pool assessment is a classic textbook use of Prop 218. As you probably know, Prop 218 was created by the Jarvis Taxpayers Association. It is a very conservative measure, and they, they, they really wanted to limit assessments to cases where the improvements, in this case a pool, were, um, were clearly above and beyond what is ordinarily supplied. As we saw, and I, was, I go to city council meetings all the time, I was blown away by the, the love for that pool here in Lompoc before. I've never seen anything like it. So it, 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 so you've done something very right. Your use of a Prop 218 um, benefit assessment in this case is, is excellent and appropriate. I did want to make a quick comment on CPI because this, particularly this year, we're getting a lot of questions about CPI because people, many, many elected officials and, and boards of directors in your position are saying, hey, is it, is it really appropriate this year to apply CPI? People are struggling financially and, and what, what is the, the, the feeling there? What I would humbly submit to you all is when the, when the property owners here in Lompoc were asked to, um, to approve this, a CPI was a big part of it. We do a lot of surveys up and down the state and we've determined, and I'm going to go out on a limb, is people don't like taxes or assessments, but they like having to come back and be asked for more money sometime in the future, they like that even less. And so really think of the CPI as something that people approve, they want it, they get it, they understand that costs go up. And all that the, uh, the recommendation from staff and from our engineering here is today is that you respond to that um, 
goal of your property owners, and they're very happy with this facility, that's the most important thing, that you continue to fund it at the true cost. And that CPI is just an adjustment of the, of the true cost. So with that, I'll, I'll, I conclude my comments, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for the history lesson, and you probably want to check out our uh, our, our new map over here. Um, are there any questions from the council at this time? Okay, seeing no. Is there anyone in the public that would like to discuss this issue? All 200 people in the back of the room are still sitting. Okay, seeing no one rise, we'll close public comment. We'll come back to the council and Councilmember Costa. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My first question, and this may be for Mr. Wilkie, uh, possibly. Um, am I correct in saying that the assessment does not even cover the debt service for the bond taken out for this? A little bit of background. The bond, the, the bond that was issued in 2004 had two components. One was part of the R RDA, which was is funded by tax increment. That's fully paid for by the tax increment that we received through RDA and is not part of this discussion. In conjunction with the RDA bond, a loan was issued at the same time supported by the assessment district revenues. That loan is approximately $2.3 million paid over 30 years. The debt service on that this year is approximately $166,000, and the available funds from this assessment, based on the number and the per property amount, is approximately 277000 around. So that is an excess of what the debt service is from the loan. So there is excess monies available for other activities, which are budgeted in the 1113 budget primarily for um, operations um, to pay for uh, a park ranger at one of the, um, the parks. Thank you for that correction. I appreciate that clarification. Um, so then that actually is a good segue into the second issue that or concern that I was having, which is that I mean, and not having as much knowledge on this topic clearly as our consultant does. Uh, for an assessment, um, is it unusual to have a sunset, or are we the unusual case not having a sunset on that assessment being taken from the, um, or, or I guess issued to the property owners? Let me answer that. Most assessments here in the state of California are for ongoing operations, first of all, so that's more typical. Maybe 10 or 20 percent are to um, pay off some sort of loan or capital, however it's structured financially. Um, so a small subset, 10 or 20 percent, are like that. The model that our firm has followed um, is that, the, that a sunset is nice and neat if at the end of a, a period of time, a facility will no longer need any kind of upgrade or maintenance. And this is kind of a roundabout way of saying, typically the, the, the pattern we're seeing and our firm is doing it and, and others are doing it as well, is that a hard sunset is not put in as part of an assessment because the presumption is at the end of the payback time for that loan, that assessment those, those assessment revenues may be helpful to upgrade rehabilitation of that facility, um, may be used for operations, maintenance, those kind of things. So hopefully that answered. So, so when, when we structure them right now, we say, hey, look, let, let's, let's tell the property owners that at the end of that payback time, it is likely the assessment will go down, but it is also likely that we'll need that revenue to continue with this facility that in this case is very successful. Thank you, and I appreciate that clarification. What I'll do is respectfully disagree somewhat in that I believe that debt service is part of the obligation um, agreed to by the property owner, but the city at that point should then take on the responsibility for operations, and if they're unable to do that, then this project shouldn't have been brought forth in the first place. That's my personal opinion. So I do understand why there are, you know, 
specific sunsets, sunsets are not put in place. Mm-hmm. But um, as we all know, the joke around town, you know, is, is sort of depressing as it is, is that, you know, our kids are going to be the ones paying off this pool. Um, and so I'd like to know, you know, if it's a 30-year, if there's a way um, on the policy side to say, hey, look, you know, the assessment either is vastly lower that 30th year or is completely um, dissolved that year. Uh, you know, and then maybe, you know, the citizens will be interested in, in another assessment for another reason. Um, I understand the idea of, of some, if there needs to be an overhaul or an update, you know, and in 30 years that's probably going to be the case. Um, but I don't like the idea of seeing this continue on indefinitely, and that was my concern when reading through this paperwork. Thank you very much for your presentations. I appreciate it. Okay. Is there any discussion at this time? Then I'd accept a motion to continue this to the next meeting. <laughs> Councilmember Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to, uh, um, what's the word we use? Continue. <laughs> continue this item into, until the, um, until the June 21st meeting. Correct. And a second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to continue this item into the June 21st meeting. Is there any other discussion from the council? Seeing no lights, could we vote, please? And that passes, 5-0. And now we'll be moving on to item 13, an agreement with the Lompoc Valley Chamber of Commerce. Huh? of Commerce and Visitors Bureau for Tourism Promotion and Business Assistance Services and a presentation by our Community Development Director Arlene Pelster. Thank you. Um, this item involves, as Mayor indicated, uh, consideration of an agreement for um, services with the Chamber of Commerce for Tourism Promotion and Business Assistance Services for fiscal year 11-13. Uh, by way of background, for many years the City of Lompoc has contracted with the Lompoc Valley Chamber of Commerce to perform services in support of our city's tourism and business promotion. Um, in the last, this is a two-year contract, and in the last two-year contract, was, which was fiscal year 2009-2011, um, due to budgetary constraints, the amount of money for the contract services was reduced. Prior to the last contract, um, the Chamber's advertising services budget was $50,000 um, in the last round, we reduced it to $37,500. Also, the portion of the contract which related to the Chamber's Tourism Promotion and Business Assistance Services was formerly $120,000 a year, and in fiscal year 2009-2011, the funding for these services was reduced by 10% in recogni recognition of our budget constraints to $108,000 a year. Um, the scope of services has remained relatively constant despite the cost reductions over the past few years. The Chamber is very proactive in the management of promotional activities which improve Lompoc's economy and our quality of life. In addition, the Chamber does uh, management of events such as the Old Town Market that promotes and brings visitors into our Old Town area. And this year's contract also provides that the Chamber will pledge to be a stakeholder in the City's economic development efforts and work with our future economic development coordinator on our uh, economic development strategies and plan. Um, the contract for fiscal year 11-13 proposes to continue the services at the same funding level, so we would be remaining at the reduced funding level from 2009 to 2011. There are some revisions to the language in the contract to better reflect the Chamber's activities and give some flexibility for advertising. During this last fiscal year, some opportunities came up to take advantage of some advertising opportunities that weren't listed in the contract. And um, rather than having to go through um, kind of the, the details that we had to pursue at that time, we'd rather have it more flexible so when a good advertising opportunity comes up, the Chamber can actually take advantage of it quickly. Um, the staff recommends that the council authorize the mayor to execute this two-year agreement for tourism promotion and business services in the amount of 216000 for tourism promotion and business assistance and 75000 for reimbursable tourism advertising expenses. And the contract amount for two years would be $291,000. And this concludes my staff report and I'm available for questions. Are there any questions for at this time? Councilmember Martner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as the Council is aware and as the public is aware, the Chamber of Commerce contract has um, 
I think over the years has generated a fair amount of um, heartache and heartburn to some constituents. Um, I don't want to discuss whether the contract has been effective or not effective. I don't think that's really what I would like to focus here. That debate probably could go on for a long time, and that's not, I'm not interested in that. What I'm interested on is that I've seen this document before. I saw it two years ago. There hardly be, has been a word change in this contract. And really what it comes down to is that we are asking all our contractors, our staff, we're asking everybody to make changes because of the economic condition in which we're in. So when I look at the contract, I go, well, maybe it was a good idea, maybe it was implemented correctly, but I know that right now probably we need to be doing some other things. And I can go through the contract and point out, you know, some things like there is a flower field map. Well, have we gone out there and see how many flower fields do we have today? Maybe one or two. Um, we have flower tours. I mean, if it comes down to, I do believe that this is probably not good tourism to be telling our visitors to go and see our flower tours because really we don't have that business here today anymore. I'm sorry to tell, I wish we did. Uh, so why don't we do something else? Why don't we try to do some other tour that might be a little bit more interesting? But that is there because at one point in time, perhaps 10 years ago, it was a great idea. But I don't think it's a great idea today. Uh, just simply because, unfortunately, we don't have that many flower fields out there. I, I go out there all the time, and I really have only seen two right now. It's hardly worthwhile to go and take a tour to go and see two flower fields. I mean, that's, you know, and I don't want to pick on the flower fields, okay? But it goes on on things like advertisement, um, the magazines. We've advertised on Sunset magazines. Can we try something else that maybe works? All I'm trying to say here is that we need to start doing things that actually work because what's been going on, it, to me, it hasn't been working because we're losing businesses. We don't are really are not flooded with tourism. And there is one aspect of this contract that is not there at all, which is what about promoting our local merchants? Yes, we want to promote our local businesses by bringing tourism, but what about our residents? Why don't we go into a campaign and the Chamber of Commerce has it here in this contract that they will promote the local businesses? I mean, there is some business assistance, there is a few words there, but there is, you know, there are things that we need to do here today. This contract was drafted 10, 15 years ago. It needs to be updated. I, you know, I have a hard time voting on the same thing without any changes. I think we need to update it. I'm willing to earmark monies for a Chamber of Commerce contract. I would like to see the new CEO of the Chamber of Commerce to bring some ideas of what that contract should be. I would like to see our new economic development director who would be managing this contract to provide some ideas of what the new contract should be. You know, we have a change here. We have new players. I want their input, and I want to see what that contract should be with the new players, because we cannot be doing the same that we have been doing, because it hasn't been working. So, at this point in time, I don't know how the council is going to be supportive of this, but I would like to say, let's earmark the monies, okay? So we can move on with our budget process, but let's rewrite this contract. And this contract has to be written for today's needs, not 15 years ago needs, today's needs. And I welcome the chamber with a new leadership in the chamber, with a new leadership in the council, with a new leadership in the staff to come up with a new contract because I think the city deserves that and it needs that, $216,000 worth of it, okay? So that's where I am, thank you. So, 
Now that brings a couple questions up. My recollection of this contract is that this is principally for tourism promotion. Is that correct? It's tourism promotion and business assistance services. Okay, but the tourism promotion has always been the larger chunk of it, I think, hasn't it? It's probably been the more visible. And um, at some point, you may want to refer to the Chamber of Commerce representatives. I think they're better informed than I am to comment on how much interest they do have in, for example, the flower field tours, how, much, um, how many inquiries they get. They're the ones who are on the ground, you know, boots on the ground day to day, and they can tell you about their level of interest in different promotional activities. But, okay. Um, but so I'll okay. do my best until you deem that Well, point you know what? Um, can you hold off a second? Bob will let them come up and give us their... Their words. That was going to be my recommendation that we hear from them, but I just one comment, and I'm as, I'm assuming they will mention it. The chamber has done. I agree with Councilmember Martiner. Maybe the flower field map isn't the best way to go right now, but the chamber on their own during this past year has done a wine tour map. Um, that's not listed as one of their requirements on there. One of the things, but they took it upon themselves. So uh, yes, I'd like to bring the chamber up here and let us hear what they are doing with our money. Okay, and I'll stand by. And for your first official appearance before the council. Well, not official. I'm not official to July 5th, but I'm, I'm still Okay, semi-official. And, and, and <clears throat> Mr. Mayor and council members, thank you uh, for your input. Ms. Martiner, I appreciate your comments, and it basically changed everything I really wanted to say. Um, coming in new to this position, um, yeah, you, yeah, you we, didn't say your name. Oh, I gave her a good. Okay, Ken Ostini, um, the uh, incoming CEO and president of the Lompoc Valley Chamber of Commerce and Visitors Bureau. And the comments Mr. Lingle made are correct. A big part of that contract is mostly tourism. Economic development is a role within the city, and I look wholeheartedly uh, forward to working with the, the new person the city is in the process of hiring to take on that role to help develop economics in our community. So that is a, is a big part of what I would like to see happen um, a, as we move along. Um, you know, the contract tonight that you're looking at and, and looking to approve in the budget may not be a perfect document, but we made some changes in working with Ms. Pelster to um, put some generic terms in there to allow the chamber uh, to do some things differently and not the same old things that have been done in the past. Yes, you talk about flower fields going away. You know, I drive by them every day. There's more than two. There's probably at least ten. Because I, I drive by them every day on my way to work right now. Uh, as Councilman Lingle mentioned, the wine tour map's not a part of that contract. So we, we did some changes in that contract to allow for some flexibility in how we do things currently in the Chamber of Commerce. So I think we have the ability to do exactly what you're talking about and input from the city and input from the new economic development director are going to be very, very important to what we do in, in, in the future years. So again, it's, you know what we do. We provided you a copy of the contract. You have a list of the activities. Dennis did a great job of listing all the, uh, the hits on the websites, the brochures that are distributed, uh, the articles in the newspapers and the magazines. Can we change how we do those things? Sure we could. That was part of the flexibility. We, we sought to do in the new contract was to allow for that, to make changes. Maybe we don't want to publicize in Sunset Magazine this year, we want to publicize in something else. We have the flexibility to, to, do, to do that. Um, but I would like to ask that you support this contract so we can move ahead and continue to provide the services that we provide for the community, because I think we provide a great service. And again, I'm new to this, and do I have new ideas? You bet I do, and I, and I have a great uh, board of directors to work with, and I look forward to working with them and the business community to, to find a way ahead to try to bring uh, more viability to, to Lompoc. So if you have questions for me, I'd be happy to try and answer them. If not, all my experts are out here. Councilmember Martiner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, I, I want to just um, reiterate the uh, Wine Trail Ghetto Map is in the contract. It's actually um, item 10A. And that was added. Uh, uh, great. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, you know, I understand what, what you're saying. Um, what, what continues to bothers, bother me about this contract is that, uh, you know, th th this 
it's very general, but, but we, we are here at the council. If you hear us every meeting, we are asking um, the community center not to be one day late, not to be a dollar over budget, okay? We are asking for accountability on everything that is going on in the city with our tax dollars. So, so this, this, this contract is, is very general, perhaps to your advantage, because it would allow you to have this flexibility that we need to figure out what is the right thing to do in this town so we can get more tourists and businesses in. But at the same time, you are obligated, uh, the chamber is obligated to our, the taxpayers to provide some deliverables. Now, website hits is not a deliverable to me. Okay, a website hit is just not something that is a deliverable that I'm gonna spend a lot of money in, okay? Because randomly people go to websites, okay? So let's really talk about deliverables. Um, and I wanna mention one, okay? The Old Town Market, every Friday. It did not happen last year. I'm sorry, it was part of your deliverables, but it did not happen last year. I wanna make sure that it happens next year and next year. If we're gonna have this contract, I wanna make sure that it happens. If it doesn't happen, then what happens when contracts do not have their deliverables? What happens? We cancel it, right? I mean, shouldn't we, shouldn't we as policy makers take that role and say, if a contract did not deliver something, shouldn't we cancel that contract? I mean, I think that's a policy and that's a perfectly fair policy and we should do it with all agencies. So I wanna make sure that, you know, if, if we're gonna have a contract, we gotta be very clear what the terms are, we gotta be, be very clear what the deliverables are, we do gotta give you a lot of room, so you're gonna have to go away and you're gonna have to sit down and say, what is it that we can deliver in the next two years? and then come back to us and say, this is what we can deliver in the next two years. And we go, okay, you know, but, but I'm sorry, you know, things like this to me just give me, not in where we are now with what we're doing with all our other, you know, staff, agencies, you know, we're being very strict, I think, because of the hard economic times that we don't have much tax dollars, right? So. I, I just don't want to say, you know, Chamber, go and do your thing. You've been doing it for the last 15 years. Here's your money. And write us a report semi-annually, which is kind of what's been happening. You know, I think we need to be a little tougher. So um, that's why I, and I know it will take time. I know it will take time on your part. I know it will take time on the staff part to write a better document than what we have here tonight. Just, just one comment about um, the Old Town Market as an example. You know, the chamber staff is a, cha a staff of three people, and we rely a lot on volunteers uh, to help run a lot of these committees and make these things happen. So I think a part of what happened last year was is the volunteers weren't able to, to come through or the community groups didn't come through to support the event was, was what I believe the reason why that didn't happen um, last year. And I, I believe it's gonna happen this year, but again, it takes a lot of help and a lot of support from more than just the chamber staff. It takes a lot of volunteers to make a program like that happen. A lot of work. Councilmember Starbuck, our chamber liaison. Yeah, I just wanna say that, you know, I, I kind of had background in, in dynamic events, and I know that you can't have your feet held to the fire for a two-year contract and you're gonna to promise to make so many maps and all that. I know that you guys do the right thing. I, I tell you, I, I also, I feel strongly about the chamber coming here and talking to us. This has been something that I've talked about with your board of directors and I'm very happy with the fact that your president does come to our meetings, you will, and you update us on what's going on and what these new changes are. We're gonna not advertise in Sunset, but we're gonna go to the LA Times now. Um, we're gonna go ahead and move in and do this map because this is what we're gonna promote now. So I understand the dynamics that happen within there, and I don't think there's any kind of a, a problem with us awarding the contract. I'm gonna go ahead and support it. Councilor Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think Council Member Starbuck looked at the notes on my paper because he just stole the words out of my mouth in regards to what um, 
Mr. Reynolds has been doing, which is coming to council meetings and updating us, and I'm really enjoying that, so much so that he may have sealed his own fate because I think that we should add a number 11 on reporting requirements that uh, <laughs> we have... No, that we have a, a chamber representative come to one council meeting per month, so you choose which one, um, and you give us an update, an oral update on, uh, I, I, it's, it seems silly, but this face-to-face -face contact has been great, and I think it's, it's uh, definitely a step forward. So, um, you know, issues and challenges or achievements or events or anything like that, I would like to, to see that happen once a month outside of the actual written reports that we should be receiving semi-annually. Now, I think that Council Member Martin brought up a good point. Um, for me, it's not a matter of checking off a box when you're talking about a requirement. We did this, check it off. It's not about that for me. It's about the quality that is occurring. So in, with the tourist calls or with the phone calls you're receiving, it's not a matter of how many calls you received. It is going to be what, your, what impact your response had. And it, that, sometimes that's very difficult to quantify, and I understand that. But for me, it would be more about efforts at looking at the quality of work that's being done instead of just a numbered requirement. So I, don't, I, I think that that's something a little different than what you're focusing on. I think for you a lot, it, it's about exactly what they should be doing. For me, it, I, stepping in today and looking over this contract for the first time, for me it's more about ensuring that the reporting requirements we have in place already are providing quality results and not just a numerical number result. So that was definitely my concern, and I didn't see any verbiage in here that really focused on that. Now, under, understand, please, that I'm not uh, you know, a contract manager. This isn't something that I am necessarily well-versed in. However, um, understanding the standards that I've been held to on, um, as a contract employee in many instances, a lot of it is about um, the quality of work you produce and not just the number of pages that you produce. So that was something I wanted to bring up. Thank you. Excuse me. Council Member Lingle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, can um, chamber membership on the rise, on the decline, st status quo? You know, I can't answer that right now. I mean, Jason probably can. I think we're, we're probably pretty status quo at this point, or maybe going up a little bit. Okay, uh, just so the people at home can understand, because Jason, where the, I'm, I'll repeat it. Um, over the past four years, if I am telling, repeating what you said, over the past four years, it's been stable, possibly a short, de a little decline, but recently it has started to increase. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, my point is, the chamber, I believe, is accountable to two, two different bodies. I, I like Council Member Costa's recommendation that. We put it in here, number no, number 11, that it is one of your obligations to report to us on a regular basis, whether it's monthly, whatever. I think that's good. But the chamber is also accountable to its members. Um, the membership would not be rising right now if the chamber were not doing their jobs. Their job is, yes, to spend our money properly, but it's really to promote the businesses in our community. To promote, you know, by promoting tourism, they are promoting our businesses. So if they were not doing their job, that is a measure of their success, membership going up. If membership had continued to decline, yeah, I'd be really concerned about rewarding this contract tonight. But as long as membership is going up, that t is telling me that you are doing a good job for the people you're supposed to be representing, and that is our business community. So it's a tough job being accountable to two different bodies. But um, I like Council Member Costa's recommendation that you, know, you report on a regular basis. Um, whether that's monthly, quarterly, whatever it is, we can decide on that. Councilman Lingo, I don't have my marching orders from my board yet, but um, increasing membership is one of my goals that I have right now. And I talked about during my interview process that increasing membership is an important goal for me. And, and I promise that Jason will come report at least once a month. Well, that's good. <laughs> and I'm sure by selling a membership, if, you were, if you're selling one to me, I'm going to say, What's in it for me? And you better have a, can I say damn? <laughs> you better have a good track record as to why myself as a business member or a community member is going to uh, pay money for membership if you are not producing. So um, exactly. keep the membership coming up. That's a, that's a good indication that you are doing a good job. 
Councilmember Martner, and then we'll go to public comment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this contract, again, is, uh, is a contract with the city to promote business, you know, tourism, actually, uh, and business assistance services. Um, to evaluate the contract on what they're doing for the business communities, kind of mixing apples and oranges, I do believe that actually the Chamber of Commerce has a bigger mission, which is to serve its members. And if I was in your board, I would say that is the number one mission, is to serve my membership. And my second mission is to, you know, to do this contract and to do the deliverables in the contract. They're two separate things, and they need to be evaluated independently. But talking about membership, um, I, I, I'm glad to hear that, yes, your membership is going up. Uh, I think that's a, that's a good sign. I hope that it continues to do so, and I hope it wasn't just one new member. I hope it was more like five or more than three, <laughs> going back to the what's more. Anyway, um, but, you know, another thing that, that I would say should be the goal of this contract is that you have so many members that you are actually independent from subsidy from the city. I mean... And we, you know, we had long discussions about the pool. Don't we want to get rid of the subsidy to the pool? Okay. Eventually, we, do, we want to get rid of subsidies. And we want all of these agencies that are working in this town to be independent of our city tax dollars. So I would say probably it's a good goal for the Chamber of Commerce to become independent of the city. And talking about actually the aquatic center, Shouldn't that be in the contract here, promotion of the aquatic center? I mean, you know, you're talking about uh, things of interest. Well, you know, the aquatic center is an attraction. Uh, has the chamber any connection with the aquatic center? Do you promote this incredible facility that we've heard about? I mean, shouldn't that be part of the contract? I mean, I'm surprised that it's not because perhaps it's one of the most uh, valued um, you know, attractions in this town right now. I'm not sure it necessarily needs to be in the contract, but it's something we should be doing. I would agree with you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, if people are going to speak, we should have them come to the Yeah, mic. and identify themselves. Okay, we're going to, we're going to, um, Bob, can you wait till we have public comment? Okay. So we're going to go to public comment, and you have to come and talk about Westways because you said something, and you have to uh, you have to sign in and. I'm new to this too. I'm Tony Astini, um, and Westways Magazine did they do a quarterly magazine through AAA membership? I don't know how many of you are. I'm not trying to promote a business one way or another, but they had a full page article, and that was separate from Sunset Magazine that promoted the town of Lompoc. And one of the one of the contributing factors was our pool, had a probably a quarter page of that advertisement. So, was that through the chamber? Or was that just an independent? Um, I'm, I don't know. It was an independent. I don't know if, if that was published. Uh, can can the, our staff answer that question? Was that through the chamber? It was a chamber input. Yeah, I'm not sure. It was that. a combination, if I may. It was called a collaboration. And of course, um, Westways contacted us as a referral, and I believe it was through the chamber. T tag team. OK. Anyone else out there that would like to come up? Come on down, Mary. Yes, I just have a brief observation. Uh, I didn't know I was going to be saying this, but as I listened to this um, new director, I think, of the Chamber of Commerce, he's at the ground level where your aquatics pool was a few years ago when it was first built. And they have done all of the heavy work, and they are showing great results and they have brought their costs down every year, four years in a row. This is not the time to switch horses in the middle of the stream. And I can appreciate all the work that he has to do to develop his program because there have been a lot of complaints about what the chamber is not doing. And I, I'm not prepared to say any of that right now, but what you said, um, 
Mrs. Marginer, in regard to um, promoting what we have in our community is wonderful. And when we work together and hold hands and work together and support each other, great things can happen. And so I can appreciate the work that he has to do because it's already been accomplished by your aquatics staff in their field. Thank you. Is there anyone else like to speak on this subject? Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Well, first, I didn't hear any declarations, so I assume none of you are now members of the chamber? Yes, I have been a member for many, many years. So we have two, two of you that are members of the chamber that will be voting on a contract for the chamber. Yes, that is correct. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, I can't uh, agree more with uh, Councilman or, uh, Martiner. Uh, her remarks are right on target. And as far as uh, uh, this contract, it's uh, so vague in some areas, and I just took out one page on the uh, uh, economic development uh, section, a little paragraph there. It says a lot and means nothing. There's absolutely, it's a worthless piece of paper. If we're gonna do a contract, then the contract should be specific in what we want out of the chamber, what the chamber's gonna give to us. Otherwise, it's not a contract. It's just a, a piece of paper with a lot of words. So we need to be very specific. And the reason I say that is, go back and look at the track record of the, the, the chamber and the uh, city and you'll see what I'm talking about. There was a, a number of years back, there was a very poor uh, track record. There was no accountability if, until uh, members of the public started to uh, ask a lot of questions and then uh, some of the more specifics got into the contract. I might also add that the city of Lompoc pays more for the chamber than any other city up and down the coast. And I just recycled all of that information because I thought, I'm not really interested in this anymore, but maybe I should have kept it out because my wife and I personally went to every chamber up and down the coast and asked them for their budget and how much was being uh, provided by the city, and we were astonished to find out that Lompoc was paying more than any other city, and some of them were a lot bigger, including Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo. Okay, thank you, sir. Is there anyone else like to speak on this subject? No, just checking the room. Okay, seeing no one rise, we'll come back to council, and um, I, I think I'll take a crack at it first since I've been sitting here quietly. Um, actually, um, my recollection is when I looked at this before, and I didn't bring my file either, is that um, the city of Santa Maria pays substantially more than the city of Lompoc does, and the research that I did, I was tying it to a percentage of bed tax because the the long ago beginning of this, depending on who you want to listen to, and I listened to myself because I was there, was that um, we promoted an increase in the bed tax rate in Lompoc to fund tourism, and the discussion at that time was that the chamber would get X amount of money to promote tourism as a percentage, and over the years, the bed tax went up and the percentage went down. Now, that having been said, that's just kind of where it came and where it went. Um, when I was chamber president in 1986, a very long time ago, there was um, a lot of discussion in the chamber about reinventing ourselves and creating new programs and some of the programs that I see the chamber doing today were created by that board a very long time ago. Um, and a chamber is like a city council or any other organization. You go through times when you're kind of cruising and then you go through times where you're innovating and changing. And you have a council here that's changed rather dramatically and is innovating and changing. And the same thing has happened over the last two years based on my outside observation. You asked if I was a chamber member, and yes, I am. 
Um, I'm trying to think the last time I went to a chamber event other than since I've been mayor, and it's probably been 10 years because I'm just not a goer and doer till lately. Um, <clears throat> so I, I've been pleased because particularly since I've been in the mayor's position, I've had a lot of conversation with the chamber and talking to Jason who is a ball of fire and has caused a lot of good things to move forward and a bunch of the other people, particularly on the wine side, they kind of just picked that whole thing up and ran with it. And um, I don't know how big a ball of fire Ken is, but I know how big a ball of fire his wife is, so I'm sure there'll be a, there'll be a lot of fun there. And I guess um, I had a conversation the other day about what should be in a contract. And it had to do with who you were dealing with. And I'm kind of really old school. I, I put some things on a sheet of paper and we sign it and we shake hands and we're done with it. I've dealt with large corporations and 50 page contracts to do something fairly small. With regard to this, I think we have some parameters within the contract, but largely we deal on trust. And I like the idea of a monthly verbal report, not an every two month, not an every three month, because I think that's valuable for the council to know what the chamber's doing so we can talk that up. And on the other side, it's valuable for the chamber to know what the council's doing so they can be involved in helping with that. And so I guess we could have a much more deal, detailed contract, but I don't see that, that would help us based on things I've seen in the past because if you deal with a crook, it doesn't matter how good your contract is. And if you deal with an honest person, you don't really need much beyond a handshake and a sheet of paper that outlines what you're going to accomplish. And that's the longest speech I've given in months. Council Member Lingle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as far as the contract being very specific, um, in, do, in, do, in all due respect to Mr. Harmon, I do not believe it should be extremely specific. A good example is if the contract were extremely specific, we would have a lot of flower field maps over the past year, but we would not have had the wine signs we talked about earlier, the way signs. Uh, we would not have seen the wine trail maps over the past year. The promotion on, of the aquatic center in the Westway Ways magazine, even though it was a collaborative effort, it was part of the Chamber of Commerce. I see nothing on that in the old contract. The uh, wine sign, uh, the wine trail map is on the new one, but it was not on their old contract. They would not have had to do that. If we keep the contract general and allow them, we talked earlier this year, we talked about being micromanagers and how terrible it is. Right now we're looking at this contract being a micromanagement of the Chamber of Commerce. If they're not doing a good job in two years, you're right, yank the contract, okay? Let them report to us on a monthly basis. Let us know what you're doing. If, if you're keeping us happy, you get your contract renewed in two years. Uh, but I certainly do not want a checklist of everything we expect them to do, and then they're going to forget about things like, oh, by the way, wouldn't it be nice to put up these directional signs to get people to the, the wine ghetto? And, oh, by the way, you know, there's not a wine trail map in the city of Lompoc. Let's get that done. But that wasn't on our checklist this year. We'll maybe get it done next year. So being very specific, I don't think so. Being general and let them become accountable, I believe they should be. Thank you. Councilmember Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My one concern is I think that sometimes there's a fine line between a crook and an honest man. And I, I, I don't know you personally, Mr. Rostini, um, and this is with no disrespect whatsoever, I'm not willing to bet $291,000 on, on which side you fall on. So for me, although specifics, I understand the need for there to be generalities there also needs to be benchmarks. So there needs to be benchmarks, and again, I'm gonna restate this, benchmarks not necessarily in what box you check off, but on the quality that we're expecting. So on the outcomes that we're expecting, these 
programs, these services, these maps to impact. Okay, so for me, it's not the amount printed. It's how many people it got to, how much it was affected. Now, I understand that's hard to quantify. I said that previously. And uh, we can't hold them to, to an insane standard that is impossible to meet. I get that as well. But there, that is one concern that I feel is somewhat missing in this contract. Now, I do have a question for staff. And that is um, sometimes in Lompoc we uh, – tend to do things in our own little different ways, and that's okay. But I'm curious if we looked at other chamber contracts, especially the surrounding areas. We have not. So that would sort of be, for me, and I'm, I'm going to fault Tim Harrington with this one. He introduced me to the Paso Robles Chamber of Commerce CEO, and I tell you what, he made me want to move to Paso Robles. And so that's a perfect example, is I would really like to see um, – you know, the work that's been done there, I know that, that you know, 10 years ago, it's, they made vast strides to where they are today. Um, and I do think a lot of that is, is what we're doing here, which is this great progression and bringing in these new people and this new blood. Um, but I would just be curious to see if some of that is also in the contract between the city of Paso Robles and the, the uh, chamber of Paso Robles. And that's just, of course, one example of many in the surrounding area. So I feel like this could be focused on a little bit more. Um, I, I, you know, I think the money's there. It needs to go to the chamber. Just want to make sure that the contract uh, is where it needs to be. Thank you. Councilmember Martner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, You know, we need to stay general, but we need to hold our agencies accountable. So to bring up the example that the wine trial signs would not have happened, well, uh, Mr. Reynolds did write a letter to the editor stating that that monies for that did not have anything to do with the city's contract. So that was something else. So let's, let's talk about the facts, okay? What is it exactly? Where, how was the money spent? Where did it go? It did not go to the wine trail signs. We need a contract that tells us where does the money go, how does it get spent. And I think that's basic fiscal responsibility. You know, it can be general, but it's basic fiscal responsibility. How did the money get spent? What were the exact deliverables? We talk about answering phone calls. Well, the phone calls are answered primarily by volunteers, as I understand. So it, they must not be using our contract money for those volunteers. Where is the money being used? Exactly. Now, you know, are we going to get into the specific financials? Where is the budget? How is that money being administered? I would like to get an update of that. Perhaps that's maybe next month's update. What is your budget? How are you paying your, you know, what is your budget? I don't even know what the Chamber of Commerce budget is. I do know that they receive monies from the city. I have a very vague contract that says uh, they are going to deliver this stuff. Um, you know, again, number of phone calls is insignificant for me, particularly if I know that it's being done by, that the phone calls are being answered by volunteers. That doesn't tell me anything how the money got spent. Uh, second, um, as Council Member Costa said, it is about what the results are. That's all of this advertisement. That's all of this stuff is providing results to the city. It's hard to quantify, but it must be done. Because if we don't know, we're going to continue to waste money. In any private business, I have to know whether my advertisement brought me revenues or not. Because if I don't know that, I cannot justify that in my next year's budget. The private businesses runs that way. When, when I go and advertise in the Lompoc record for my private business, and I have customers coming in into my store, I ask them, how did you hear about me? Okay? And if they say, well, I read your ad in the Lompoc record, then I know, oh, I'm going to put my ad in the Lompoc record again. I don't know what the outcome of, of what the chamber is doing. I really don't know. The reports have not been very specific. So I have difficulties approving a contract with generalities and with a lack of deliverables that are going to tell me how the money is going to be spent and whether it was fruitful or not, as Council Member Costa said. It's about being fruitful. Did it work or did it not work? Because if it didn't work, we're going to have to do something else, right? 
And I'm sure that the chamber wants to know that answer as well, because they're interested in this community. The board of directors, all the chamber members, you know, everybody is interested in the success of this community. So therefore, we have to figure out if what we're doing is right, right? And you need to help us that. And, and this contract is not helping the way it's been written right now. So, I, you know, I'm sorry. I like to earmark, earmark the monies. I think they need to go to the chamber. And I think the new leadership in the chamber, along with the new leadership in the staff, need to write a contract and bring it back to the council uh, with new, very specific deliverables and goals. And that's where I stand. And I know that probably um, I won't get the support from the council, but I will stay on my stand. Thank you. Uh, Dennis, could you come up for a moment, please? Uh, when you run an ad, what is your tracking method to see the results? Um, our, our ads in Sunset Magazine, for example, and uh, California Visitor Guide and Westways um, run in specific months. And in Sunset, for example, you'll go to the travel section in the back, you'll find our ad. And also there's an insert, a small reply card back there that readers will circle what they're interested in. They mail that into Sunset Magazine. Sunset accumulates all of these and they uh, forward that information to the various advertisers. So once a month, twice a month, sometimes three times a month based on the, the frequency that they get those cards, we will receive a database of how many people were interested and those folks get mailed out a visitor packet. And we keep track of how many responses we got from Sunset how many responses we got from Westways, et cetera, based on that kind of input. There are some uh, visitor guides, the Santa Barbara County Visitor Guide, for example, and um, the California Visitor Guide, um, well, the Central Coast Visitor Guide and Santa Barbara County Visitor Guide, who don't employ that method. So we don't have a, a real good sense of um, the responses from those, except that we do get people in occasionally who'll say, I was up in Pismo Beach, I picked up a Central Coast Visitor Guide, I saw your ad, here I am. Um, and so we, we have that kind of tracking. But more formally on the Sunset Magazine and Westways, we do have that tracking uh, mechanism courtesy of the actual publishers. Okay, and when you ran LA Times ads, what was your, your matrix for determining we, we, ran, we ran a couple of LA Times ads in their quarterly Central Coast tourism tabloid as an experiment, first of all. And um, in our ad, we had our, our address and we, we inserted a special email address for replies that was specific to that ad only. It appeared nowhere else. So that remained specific to the LA Times ad. So if anything came in on that email address, we'd know where the source was. Um, in addition, as people called in, they would say, oh, I saw your ad in the LA Times, I'm interested in this, this, and so forth. So based on the uh, email responses and the phone calls, did you find the Times ad was uh, more, more effective? We, we didn't, we, we could not, quantify that because advertising doesn't take effect sometimes right away. It takes two or three placements. We got some response from the LA Times ad. We got no response by email. They were all phone calls, which was kind of interesting in this day and age when everybody is uh, dependent on emails. But we got phone calls and they specifically said, I saw your ad in the LA Times and they requested information. And, uh, we didn't get an overwhelming response, but sometimes it takes three or four placements before you actually see some kind of a response out of an ad. Cumulative effect. And what what uh, mailing would they have received? They would receive our, our visitor packets, um, and I brought a sample of one this evening. Um, whenever we get the lists from Sunset Magazine or we get phone calls for visitor packets, we have a set visitor packet that we send out. And in addition, if they say, we'd also like additional information on 
um, the mission or mission activities or specific uh, information relative to real estate or um, you know educational opportunities will stuff those extra things in there to to uh, customize them for those people but um, most of them get the standard visitor packet, which has several of our brochures in there and kind of a general um, informational brochure about Lompoc. Yes. <laughs> we, and and I'm, I might, as long as I'm up here, if I could take the opportunity. Go ahead. It's a soapbox time. Uh, well, I don't, I don't want to beat the dead horse here, but I would, I would like to address the fact that we do offer promotional support for many of the nonprofits in town who conduct community-wide special events. Uh, and that ranges from the, the Lompoc Pops Orchestra to the Lompoc Civic Theater, the Concert Association, Parks, Recreation, and Urban Forestry for many of their events, uh, school district events, um, the Half Century Club. Um, we help them as much as we can to get the word out about their special events, not only locally, but, um, you know, more globally in some of this information. So we stand ready to help them, and sometimes they don't ask us to help. And something will come across my desk, and I say, I think I'm going to help them with this particular event because times are tough, and they, they all need the assistance. And so we stand ready to help those organizations as well and not just um, depend on tourism and that sort of thing. Those organizations also benefit from the tourism. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councilor Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilman Rulinga, I want to go back to something I believe you said, but please correct me if I'm wrong, which is that you let them fulfill the two-year contract, hold them accountable, and then if at the end of that two-year contract you're dissatisfied, you cancel the contract. I said we, we always have that option. Okay. So then my question is more to what standards are they being accountable? We know what duties they're being accountable for, but to what standards are they being accountable? Now, please don't get me wrong. I would hate to have to vote no on this at this point, and then everybody's going to think I'm you know, not supporting the chamber. That's definitely not the case. I repeat, definitely not the case. I actually, in fact, think that they're already doing that. What I would like to simply see is a small retooling of the contract to show that on paper the standards and also that they'll be required in the report to show the fulfillment of those standards. That, for me, it's, it, I, I'm, I'm on a little bit of a different wavelength than Councilmember Martner in that I think that there needs to be small retooling to include that, and I wanted to just see if we could discuss that. And again, also, some of that may be referring to other chamber contracts with cities and seeing what they do and seeing what standards those chambers are being held accountable to. Thank you. Councilmember Starbuck. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> I recall six months, roughly a time frame ago, that the chamber, didn't you come up with a fairly lengthy report on strategic goals and objectives that you were going to accomplish? It was actually a published in the paper that I've kept. Is that still going to be a viable baseline for what you intend to do? Come to the microphone. People at home can't hear you or see you. I forget you can't that. be a TV School star. School means we don't have it broadcast to the public. So um, th that was one of my uh, main topics when I interviewed for the position was to develop. And, and I know that the chamber board has developed a, a strategic plan. I would like to look at that, refine that, and, and actually have a document that has goals and objectives that you can measure and provide input to the entire community about you know, how well we're doing. So yes, that is a, is a high priority for me as I take over in that position, so. So, so that's still a, gonna be a baseline valid document for you. You already have that in place. There's one in place now. How much has been used since it was established, I, I don't know, but I, I think we need to, I, I definitely think that needs to be re-looked at and readdressed and, and maybe just need some tweaking um, to, to be a viable document. Councilmember Costa whispered in my ear, perhaps um, adding that as a, a supplement to the contract as a yardstick would be a good thing. You guys have any problem with that? I don't see the problem. Okay. Councilmember Martner. Oops, sorry. Did I catch? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think actually adding your strategic goals uh, should be part of this contract um, because, again, how many hats are you 
wearing, okay? So, I mean, you, you need to have a common goal and you need to have, a, a, you know, an overall, uh, basically you need to have an overall plan and to be able to execute it with a few hands and, you know, people that you have, you need to put it all together into one. And so, so it really looks like to me that that needs to be part of this contract. Um, as far as, you know, um, I agree with Council Member Lingle that, um, you know, contracts, you know, you can always, after two years, you can award the contract, and after two years, you can say, no, they didn't do well, they didn't deliver, and you can cancel them. Um, I mean, that's fine, but again, what are we going to rate you against? This, you know, and this is the history of this town, which, you know, we have come to learn to our, <laughs> you know, just incomprehensible thing that um, we don't have evaluations, we don't know how to rate performances in our city staff. Um, previous councils haven't done it. Uh, there are members of the public out there that feel that the chamber has not done what they were supposed to do, so perhaps previous councils should have can canceled the contract, but it wasn't done. So we have a history, and we have to turn that history around, and we have to say, now it's done, we're done, okay? We, we're going to give you a contract, you're going to have very specific deliverables, and the same way that we are holding our staff accountable. All our projects, we're doing this, and I don't see that the Chamber of Commerce should be treated any way, in any way differently. So, I, you know, I do want, you know, more specifics, and like a Council Member Costa, we need a standard. How are we going to know two years from now that you did okay? You know, is that going to be based just on one elected official that you know, thinks it's okay or not okay? No, it should be based on facts, it should be logical, and it should not really be uh, biased. So, so we need that before we can, you know, before we can say, okay, let's go for it, because we don't have other, otherwise we don't have a way to rate you, and we need to establish that in the contract, and I think that good, there is a good idea to put uh, what your general goals and strategy plan is for the city, to put it as part of the contract, along with very specific standards on how the successes are going to be measured. And are they going to be above average, average, or not adequate? Um, question for the city attorney. If we enter into a contract with the chamber or anyone else, and uh, in the course of the contract, in this case it's a two-year contract, but let's say nine months up the road, um, it was obvious whoever it was, the chamber or someone else, that they weren't fulfilling the contract. Do we have an obligation to proceed through the entire two-year period? No, Section 6 gives you the right to terminate the agreement um, on notice, and it's an immediate termination, and it's with or without cause. So this is basically an at-will contract? Basically. Okay. Um, Knowing that, that uh, I'm still back to my handshake, so I guess I'm comfortable with the people there and knowing that they're going to create a new plan for the organization, but what I think would, would probably set well with several people would be that you would have that plan and you would bring it back to us at the six month review period and incorporate it in at that point in time and that gives number one we have continuity and we're moving forward with this but number two we have your plan that you bring back and we incorporate that with the contract and with the understanding that I, I, I think we should make Jason come back every month even if he's not president anymore no that yeah you would come back or the president would come back on a monthly basis and give us an, an update as Jason has done, because that's been very valuable. Uh, I, I would be comfortable supporting this with those two additions. And um, I'm sure the city attorney can appropriate wording to accomplish those two things. Councilmember Costa. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I definitely think that's a good start. I agree with both of those additions uh, wholeheart wholeheartedly. However, I still, I still don't think we're there yet. I, I don't. I still think that, again, I'm going to ask the question, to what standards will the chamber be held accountable? I, I, I am apparently much different than you, and that's okay for us to have a fundamental difference. I, based on a handshake, that I'm not comfortable with that. It needs to be in writing, in a contract, in a you know, biannual report, so these things can be reviewed and monitored past when you're in office. That's definitely my concern. Thank you. Um, perhaps we would work over the same six month period to improve our metrics of measurement because I agree with one thing that you said very strongly. It's not the number of things you do. Anyone can put 627 pieces of mail out there, but if the 627 pieces of mail don't get you anything, and I, I didn't realize that they tailored things and put things in envelopes, but in, along the way, working on economic development since I've been mayor, I've called the chamber a number of times said, hey, can you put something together and do this? And they've been very responsive. So um, maybe it would be good since you're going to get measured if you folks in the chamber made some suggestions on not just the quantitative method of measuring a given item, but the qualitative measure. And you could incorporate that with your report back to us in six months. But that's, that's not a standard. And now, Councilmember Starbuck. Yeah, I was just going to bring something up here. You know, this whole conversation should have been held, obviously, during our budget workshop, but because of communication, we're going to bring it up here at Council. I want us to go back and think about the day we sat here and when we gave away money to the museum. We did not ever once question what their strategic objectives were, what they were going to do with this money, what their plan was, and what, how they were going to update us on a contract. I'm going to say the same thing about the library. I said, okay, we agree. We will give you the money you requested as funded. I don't know why we're going to turn around now and just needle this thing out on this. This is, it, you can't do this kind of a contract where you want accountability and benchmarks. Councilmember Martner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the library and the museum provide a public service to all residents of Lompoc. Um, the Chamber of Commerce could, um, you know, provide a ser service to their members, and they do provide uh, support to the community uh, with various different forms. Um, now that you bring up this aspect, another thing that is really difficult with this is that if we're going to be giving public monies, to an organization that only supports their members. It's also conflictive. Um, I've been contacted by two merchants in Lompoc that are not chamber members, unfortunately, and uh, they were told by a customer that when they call the Chamber of Commerce and they ask uh, whether this type of business was in Lompoc, the Chamber of Commerce said no because apparently the policy of the Chamber of Commerce is to only uh, advertise and talk about their member chambers, their chamber members. So if you're not a member of the Chamber of Commerce, you may not receive this wonderful support and fruit and this advertisement. But nevertheless, you're getting tax monies, you know. So, so, so Let's not go there, and I, wasn't, I didn't want to bring it up, but, but, but you know, this is, this is an event. This actually happened in this town. So the Lompoc Museum is not going to close a door on somebody that is not a member, okay? The library is not closing a door on somebody that is not a member. Uh, the chamber can exercise the right not to refer to a business that is not part of their membership. That's, that's their policy. They have that right. So... So it's not a good comparison. But let's get back to the contract. Um, 
you know, okay, so let's talk about six months. Let's say that uh, in six months, for, let's award the contract, let's award a contract for six months and say in six months from now, um, the board of directors, the, the CEO, the, the president of the chamber are going to come back and, and include uh, what their strategic goals are in the contract. And at the same time, uh, I assume it's going to be the staff, the economic development, that is going to set up a standard by which we would include in this contract that would uh, help us evaluate the successes of this contract. You know, we can do that, but, it's, but we need to have a very clear goal that in six months we're going to be back here discussing what the contract is about. Uh, if, if the council is willing to go there, um, um, I will support it. I will support it. But, but only with the condition that in six months from now we come back with what the overall strategic plan of the Chamber of Commerce is, and number two, that the staff comes back with a set of standards by which uh, this contract can be evaluated at the end of its term. Councilmember Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would uh, definitely support that 100%. Just again, urging staff in, in the six months you're doing research to look at other chamber and city contracts, um, but also that um, the language that we've all said would add the monthly reporting um, to the next six months instead of waiting till after that six month period. So having that language Starts immediately. Yeah, having that language uh, in this current contract for the next six months. My, my thought on that is that, that, rep that the monthly report that Jason will make to us is, would begin uh, actually next meeting. So you could get a report in this month, since we didn't have time today, and that you would bring back prior to six months your goals and objectives. And if you fail to do that, according to our city attorney, we could just cancel you like a stamp. And I think that covers all those concerns. You're talking about uh, a measure, a measurable standard. Right. Yeah. From, from the city staff or the I think it would. I think we would charge our economic development director with that. Yeah, but it wouldn't be their fault if we didn't get it done. It would be our fault if we didn't make sure that that got done. We couldn't put that on them. We could put that on the five of us, which I would happily uh, do. Absolutely, but the point is, is that we need to hold ourselves accountable. Absolutely. Too. So yes. we have the responsibility. This the city council, along with the staff, has the, repos the, the responsibility to generate a set of standards by which this contract can be evaluated in a six-month period. And they need to be not a, not just a quantitative standard, but a quality standard. Measure of success. Yes, there we go. I like that phrase. Okay, Councilmember Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to say, uh, for probably ease of agenda and such, and the way you've been doing it, I think works well. Is that the um, report, the monthly report, will be given during oral communications during the first session of oral communications? You know, not to exceed five minutes or something like that. Yeah. Just so that way, you know, we don't have to designate a special time, but during all communications. Yep. All good things. Um, Councilmember Starbuck. Yeah, uh, I'd like to move that we extend the meeting till you know, at least 1130. Uh, I'd like to, I'd prefer if you just said we make it till 12, so we don't have to go back and hit this again. 12, I'll be done by then. I move we move the meeting till 12. Okay, and a second. I second. <laughs> It's been moved and second. Do we need a real vote or can we just nod? We need a real vote. All in favor, please signify by pressing the green button. And the meeting is hereby extended until midnight. Okay. Now, so, so I can summarize for the city attorney. Do you understand all the things that we told you? You're good with all that? We, we are going to add language to the contract that requires them to come back within six months to bring their strategic goals. We're going to want a report monthly starting with the uh, next meeting in June. Yes. And we want to have evaluation criteria for, to, for us to be able to 
evaluation criteria to measure their success, both quantitatively and qualitatively. And my assumption, and I just want to ask my fellow council members, is that the chamber would be involved in helping develop those things so we get something that's, use, that's useful. Sure. We're not going to just pull something out of the wind and say, here it is. Hey, Kay, are, is your light still on or are you happy? Next, Mayor Costa. I hope I don't take this away from you, Councilmember Martner, but so moved. <laughs> Okay, so now having gotten all that okay. done, <laughs> I would accept a motion from someone to uh, move. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't and hear I that. And I second. Ah. And I missed it. Okay, it has been moved by Councilmember Costa and seconded by Councilmember Martner. Um, what Joe said. And is there any further discussion? Would anybody like Joe to repeat that three more times? No. Just I kidding. just ask and see if they have a problem with the contract having that amendment. Uh, I'm sorry. This is just down to council now. Um, yeah. Once we close oral communication, it's just for us. I'm going to ask the chamber whether or not they have a problem with adding all that language. Any issues there, guys? All smiles and happiness? Okay. Staff? Any issues with coming up with something six months from now? Okay, life is good. So, any other discussion? Seeing none, let's vote. And that passes 5-0, and I would like to thank all the council members for spirited input. And we will now take uh, three minutes. And now for the real main event, we'll come back to session, and we will have our budget presentation from our chief budget guru, who is now smiling again, our city administrator, Laurel Barcelona. Honorable mayor, city council members, it's uh, the tail end of a long night, but <laughs> staff is pleased to present to you an overview of the fiscal year 2011-13 proposed biannual budget. Each of you have a copy of the draft bound budget reflecting total budget expenditures, the, total, the city's total budget of $173,678,568, a reduction of nearly $3.3 million from the 09-11 budget expenditures. The draft bound proposed budget before you is the culmination of an eighth, eight month-long budget process, which involved several council special meetings, uh, budget meetings requiring uh, council staff and city departments uh, to work many long hours. This budget reflects staff's best efforts at translating city council's priorities into a financial document, which provides the city council information for making policy decisions regarding services and programs during the 11-13 two-year city budget uh, cycle. As a result, the difficult economic uh, climate over the past years, the increased CALP and increased Cal's, CalPERS retirement pension costs, which have been driving up employee salary costs, uh, council and staff have worked hard to set in place budget balancing action uh, actions in an effort to close the earlier projected general fund budget gap of $2.9 million. Staff is pleased to report that City Council's actions successfully closed the budget gap. The two-year general fund operating budget of $50,767,175 uh, $50 is balanced without the use of general fund reserves. Therefore, the general fund reserve amount of $6.5 million remains whole is 26% of the fiscal year 11-12 budget year and includes reserves of $2 million in the economic uncertainty fund. The general fund budget reflects a decrease of 2% or $913,085 from the 09-11 budget. To review, the budget process began eight months ago in October of 2011 with budget training provided uh, department staff and after several council meetings and staff meetings, uh, the process culminates in a timely presentation of the fiscal 
year 1113 proposed budget to you tonight. And should you desire to adopt this proposed budget, staff has prepared a city resolution for your approval. This slide reviews the three-pronged approach toward achieving council's budget objectives. Uh, staff translated these council budget objectives to a savings plan for closing the 1113 budget deficit. Working to uh, realize budget savings through union negotiation measures and uh, following council's ratification of the tentative agreement with the firefighters local 1906 tonight, good faith negotiations will continue with the two remaining labor groups. And on the following slide, I'll uh, review the actions taken by uh, council to achieve the, uh, the actions taken to achieve council's objectives to realize savings through management consolidations and organizational restructuring as well as holding several vacancies during this budget cycle. As stated earlier, council's objective was to not use general fund reserves. At the budget meetings of May 3rd and 9th, council unanimously approved three departmental consolidations effective December 31st, 2011, resulting in the elimination of two general fund department heads, realizing a general fund savings of $266,325. And these savings, along with holding several general fund positions vacant during this budget cycle, realizes a net general fund savings of nearly 1.7 million. Council and administration recognize these Actions require significant sacrifices of all affected departments and especially understand that vacancies of public safety positions are not optimal and can only be considered for the short term. To mitigate the vacant police officer positions, we anticipate an, an award of a federal COPS grant in the near future for at least three frontline grant officers. And I would also bring to Council's attention in addition to uh, three known firefighter vacancies, I was recently advised the fire department is working with four firefighter vacancies. And the fourth vacancy is the result of uh, my appointment of Battalion Chief States as Acting Fire Chief, resulting in his fire crew moving up to cover each of these positions uh, below Acting Fire Chief States creating a fourth firefighter vacancy. Thus, I have instructed human resources staff to begin the recruitment process to hire a firefighter to fill this temporary vacancy and create an eligibility list for the future. Uh, these three general fund positions outlined on this slide have been restructured, shifting a percentage of all allocations from the general fund to realize total savings of 132,758. I would emphasize at this time that uh, while staffing has been reduced as well as restructured and that while it is reasonable to anticipate impacts to our overall service levels, uh, customer service objectives to provide our customers the highest level of service with a friendly customer focused approach remains our citywide policy. The fiscal year 1113 budget provides essential services, which are services protecting the health, safety, and desired quality of life necessary for effective city government. The budget implements council's priorities, does not use general fund reserves, and thus required very conservative budgeting decisions, primarily due to the anticipated CalPERS retirement pension increases of uh, nearly two million during this budget cycle. Uh, Utility rate increases are anticipated during this budget cycle for water and wastewater due primarily to uh, increased costs for providing services. Budget assumptions uh, include continued state funding and while significantly, significantly reduced, the public library funds continue as well as funding of post police library reimbursement. The budget assumes continuation of state COPS funding that pays 100000 each year toward the cost of one police officer and one dispatch jailer. And the proposed budget reflects assumed funds from all three uh, city labor group contract concessions and salary savings anticipated from employee turnover during this budget cycle. And that's based on the historical rate of turnover realized 
during past budgets. Staff proposes no new positions in the general fund, uh, reclassific reclassifications or equity increases uh, for general fund positions. Additionally, no general fund capital improvement projects are proposed for the 11-13 budget. Uh, departments submitted uh, general fund capital outlay requests totaling uh, seven million and a uh, total of 6.8 million um, capital outlay requests have been denied, leaving uh, 152,747 uh, requests that have been approved. And that amount will fund the fire breathing apparatus, police ballistic vest replacement, and uh, several IS computer network upgrades. The uh, funding for police rain gear is reflected in the department's line item expenditure budget. All city department line item budgets reflect uh, conservative budgeting efforts and um, has realized the uh, savings of $913,085 from the 0911 expenditures. The uh, personnel summary outlined on pages E1 through E9 in your bound budget refre reflects the elimination of uh, two full-time equivalent general fund positions and that is the elimination of the full-time in-house city attorney and assistant city attorney as a result of the uh, contract with Alshire and Winder for uh, attorney services. And as stated earlier, uh, three position allocations have been restructured to shift costs from the general fund to realize savings and nine general fund positions have been identified during this budget to remain vacant. This slide outlines capital outlay costs for uh, city enterprise funds, the solid waste, electric, water, wastewater and broadband Wi-Fi divisions. And this slide shows each general fund revenue source in relation to the total general fund revenues. And uh, you note the property tax, property tax is 26% of the pie and sales tax is 14% of this pie. Uh, this pie chart shows the general fund department expenditures in relation to total expenditures. And this last pie chart shows the general fund expenditures uh, by type in relation to total expenditures. And as you see, the largest portion of uh, the pie uh, is salaries and benefits, nearly three quarters. And the second uh, largest piece is the supplies and services. And then the little, little piece of pie there is uh, the approved capital outlays. Well, I mentioned earlier, uh, nine general fund positions are, are identified to remain vacant during this budget cycle. Uh, this slide outlines 21 total vacancies citywide, many of which have been vacant since adoption of the fiscal year of 9-11 budget. Uh, the finance, accounting, and revenue manager listed on uh, this slide will be filled during this budget and staff will continue to monitor the viability of these vacancies during the 11-13 budget. The fiscal year 11-13 budget reflects adequate funding to implement some of council's priorities expressed during the council goal setting workshops of 2010-2011 including uh, economic development activities through the hiring of an economic development director, assistant city administrator, working with RDA, CDBG, and planning division staff in concert with community stakeholders to develop and implement a strategic plan for economic development in the Lombok Valley. Funds for graffiti abatement are budgeted in public works department to fund part-time salaries and the uh, 
purchase of equipment to ensure ongoing graffiti abatement during this two-year budget cycle. And I'm pleased to say that this program is underway with the hiring of Mr. Norm Flint to carry out these activities. Uh, funds are budgeted in the CDBG and general fund budgets to cover costs of the senior code enforcement officer working in administration department with the city attorney and the paralegal to resolve and gain voluntary compliance of our most difficult code enforcement cases. <laughs> Excuse me. Funds have been encumbered to fund the purchase of laptops for city council as well as to cover costs for uh, conversion of the council dais to install needed electrical components to allow reception of Wi-Fi in the council chambers. And the fiscal year 11-13 budget includes funding to continue city contracts with broad spec for building services and with the law firm of Alshire and Winder for city attorney services. Staff recommends council review the proposed budget and if council desires to adopt the budget tonight, approve resolution number 5725, parent 11, or adjourn to the city, uh, to this council special budget meeting of Saturday, June 11th, commencing at nine o'clock in the morning uh, in the council chambers. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank each of you for your assistance and support of city staff during this challenging budget process. And I would also thank the department heads and city staff for their assistance and support during this budget. I especially thank Management Services Director Brad Wilkie and the finance staff, Human Resources Manager Beth Flam Overby, Human Resources Staff, Administrative Aide Carol Smith, Information Systems Manager Jeff Collins, and Johnny Gonzalez, printing and web technician for uh, their dedication, patience, and hard work in coordinating the preparation of this budget. Again, thank I thank each of you and your commitment and hard work during this budget process. And uh, this concludes staff's report. Uh, Management Services Director Brad Wilkie and I are available to answer questions. And Mr. Wilkie is prepared to brief on uh, the enterprise funds or other funds as outlined on page D5 in your bound budget. And thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, uh, I would like to invite Mr. Wilkie to the podium. Thank you. Mr. Uh, I'm make a comment. Thank you for I'm indulging me. me. The, um, this will be very <laughs> brief. It's just a, uh, you have the budgets in front of you. There are some handouts that are available for the audience if they um, would like to follow along. I'm just going to go over a couple of the utility funds and in brief go over the um, Jenner fund components that are uh, make up our, our budget. Um, just get through this. Um, one of the Schedules in the budget, I believe it's D4, um, shows the uh, various components of the general fund department budgets broken down by salary benefits, services and supplies, and capital outlays. Uh, this is a condensed version of that. Um, I left off the totals on the right just to make it a little bit clearer to be able to read. Um, the graphs that were shown in um, the city administrator's presentation are from this from this the um, the 75.1 percent of the general fund budget the 37 million dollars is part of that third graph that was pre presented as is the 12 million two for service and supplies and the smaller 153 
thousand dollars for our capital outlays. Uh, what this does show is the the general unallocated cost by department within the general fund. And what I mean by unallocated is there are certain departments we've gone through in previous sessions that are for the benefit of the city overall and that portion of those activities that are providing services outside the general fund are paid for by those external entities such as uh, the utility funds. Um, I have a couple of asterisks here. The, the building inspection is, has been realigned from the fire department that it was there in the 09-11 budget. It's now a division incorporated within the engineering public works department. Um, city administration is a combination of a few different departments and for brevity it's just uh, put together into one line item city administration. Um, as I said, this is in the, the budget page D4 and it just gives a little bit of uh, more detail of the general fund for each of the departments that are there. Uh, from there I'll go on. Um, page D5, I believe it is in the budget, has a overall summary of every fund that the city operates um, starting with the general fund and going down to Charles Webb, this is a uh, condensed version of that summary showing most of the major funds that are being utilized to provide for services. And I just want to concentrate on a couple of these. Um, the reserves that was talked about earlier, um, this $300, which is the contribution to reserves for the general fund on a $50 million budget for the two years is probably as close as you can get to not using reserves and not putting reserves away as you can get. Um, looking at the contribution from reserves, this is the use of reserves from each individual departments. The special gas tax fund has built up money over time primarily because last budget we utilized several um, stimulus funding opportunities to do road work which provided for less use of um, gas tax. And what is being proposed this year is to ramp that back up since stimulus monies are no longer available. And we are using some of those built up reserves to do that work to continue the um, road work that can be done for streets and roads. Um, on the other side of it, the contribution to reserves is where we don't spend as much as we get in on the various funds, and I'll concentrate here on the electric utility. In November of 2009, um, the council voted to approve um, a set of rate increases that will help um, return the fund reserves back up to the, um, close to the reserve policy that's in place for the electric fund. This 5.8 million roughly is a recognition of the fact that we will be uh, replenishing our operating reserves uh, and by the end of this period we should have very very close to a um, zero dollar amount in operating reserves which is a significant significant improvement over where we are right now uh, that's not to say that we don't have reserves in the electric utility we do have reserves on hand at our um, the NCP agency that we belong to that supplements our operating reserves here at the city. Um, in contrast to that improved situation for the electric fund, um, earlier was mentioned that we will be considering uh, increases for the water utility and wastewater utility. This $1.25 million use of reserves for the water utility and the $2.6 million roughly use of reserves for the wastewater utility reflects a disparity between the income we're bringing in in those two utilities through user fees and the cost that we're spending to operate those two utilities. Um, I bring that up because those are the, the next two slides are related to those utilities. Um, it's a summary of the 
detail that's in the budget for those ut two utilities. Uh, first of all is the water utility. Um, what we show here is consistent with the way we show all the other various funds and departments. Um, in the case of the water utility, um, the capital outlay totals of the 2.855 in the last two year budget um, had been less than that in the budget cycle before then because we were ramping up from utilizing the 2007 and 2005 bonds. So there is a fairly small difference between the 09-11 budget for capital outlays and the department has done a good job at um, keeping in check the services and supplies. The salary and wages is increased. That's mostly a reflection of the co cost of PERS increases. Um, capital outlays has been reduced to try to minimize the, um, the revenue, the net shortfall that we are seeing in the utility. Um, the end result of this is that the recommendation by the administration is to do a comprehensive rate review for the water utility uh, to look at this disparity to eliminate that 1.24 um, revenue shortfall. Um, that will be done in conjunction with your um, approval with the wastewater utility. In the wastewater utility, as you know, we've been done the improvements for the wastewater plant, which was done primarily with debt, debt and loans from external sources. In the 2010 year was the first year that we had to start paying back the state revolving loan fund for the $79 million loan that we got from them. That one payment per year is about $4.5 million. And that's primarily the, the difference between the, the $8 million that we had budgeted two years ago and the $12 million that we have budgeted this year because we have to have that payment paid in each of the two years. And last budget cycle is just one of the two. Um, what I see in this situation is that of our entire expenditures for proposed, um, debt service is almost half of the entire cost of operating the utility. Um, that is a fixed debt that we have for more than 20 years due to the loan and the, the, the bond debt that we have. Um, most of the charges that we have up top are somewhat variable based on water volume that is utilized by our customers and that amount um, would probably need to be looked at to be able to sustain our existing debt service at, at the amount that it is right now. Um, barring any, any other uh, debt that we incur, the, the $12.15 million is going to probably be out there for a significant number of years and we have to make sure that our charges for services can cover that and that more importantly that those cover our obligations that are under our debt covenants with the, the 2005 and 2007 and 1998 debt issues. Um, one thing that I discussed with our utility director is um, the existing rate structure had a set of rate increases that began in 2006. Um, for the wastewater utility, the last of those rate increases became effective in June of 2010, which is a year ago. And for water, it was a, the last one was effective June of 2009, two years ago. So we ha have had about one to two years of uh, not looking at a rate increase, but we've actually had since 2006, we haven't done a rate study to see if our existing rates are adequate to cover our operations. And that's primarily the reason why my suggestion and the recommendation in the budget is to do a look at water and wastewater rates to be able to come up with a rate structure that fits our existing obligations under our debt and our existing capital needs and operational needs. Um, that pretty much ends this part of the um, presentation. I will be here for other questions. Those are the highlights that I wanted to 
touch on. And I know there's probably other questions, but that's the two main things I wanted to discuss. Thank you. Um, before we go down the road a little ways, I just have a couple of things I want to, and I actually wrote them down and print them out because I think it's important. And um, the first one deals with labor concessions because this has been a very difficult topic for both, uh, for, well, for all of us. And while the council recognizes um, the sacrifices made by all city employees and our labor groups during this budget, we're a family and thus we must all share equally in the pain of our budget constraints during this upcoming two-year budget cycle through employee concessions. However, it is my hope and I, I hope it is uh, the rest of the council's feeling that future increases in tax revenue will be realized and this will allow employee concessions to be incrementally reduced and eventually restore employee salaries and overtime. Um, I want to acknowledge and commend all the city employees for understanding and cooperating during these difficult budget times and I think we should all be particularly proud of unlike other cities uh, we haven't people have not lost their jobs we've we've worked through this and we've done the very difficult things that that caused us to be successful in in having a balanced budget when Frankly, a lot of people said it couldn't be done. Um, from my standpoint, one of the things that I came into this for was to increase public safety, and I think that's also universally shared by this council. And in this budget, um, we're not going to fill three vacant positions in the fire department, and we're deferring the purchase of a replacement brush truck fire engine. Um, we are maintaining our minimum staffing levels through the use of overtime so that the number of on-duty firefighters is not reduced. Both our chief and the International Association of Firefighters Local 1906 have agreed that this is a short-term plan. Um, we've chosen to defer the purchase of the truck because it was the last thing that got us over the top. and. Again, these are things that we will be looking at as a council and as an administration as we go along so that as things get better, and they are getting better, we can unwind the things that we had to do and do the things that we would really like to do. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. And I just want to thank everybody for, for um, taking the hit. It hasn't been very easy. It's been a very tough time, and I'm sorry, I don't know who had their light on first. Councilmember Martner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would like to, um, I guess I would like to thank the city administrator and Mr. Wilkie, uh, since I guess those were the two staff members that we spent a lot of time with uh, during this budget cycle. Um, also, I guess all the directors uh, that were involved, and um, you know, this is really nice. We're talking about new. I mean, this is, uh, you know, as little as it is. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very nice um, artwork, whoever did it. Uh, but it kind of shows that um, we're trying to do things a little differently. And, you know, this is 200 pages. We've gone through it a lot. I, I really have still a lot of questions, but, um, I, I, I'm not ready to, to, to spend the next 20 minutes with questions. Um, I think uh, we've done the job that we set ourselves to do. I think the staff did follow the recommendations that the council gave and for the best that I've been able to, to review this 200 page document, it appears that they executed what we asked them to do. So at this point in time, that's all I can ask for. <laughs> Uh, that they executed what the majority of this council, um, you know, requested. So um, I just want to say thanks. Amen. Councilmember Lingo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I agree with Ms. Martiner. It's um, it was a 
We owe a lot of thanks to the city administrator and uh, Mr. Wilkie for their hard work. Um, sometimes, I guess we're going to be taking the credit for a balanced budget, but we, we definitely could not have done it without the staff and uh, the assistance of you two. The artwork, for those of you that are still up and awake, the artwork that Ms. Martiner was talking about is a rendition of the face of our new community center, the uh, uh, Dick DeWeese Community and Senior Center. It's, uh, it's coming along real fine, and it is a good re rendition, rendition of it. Um, Mr. Wilkie, I have a question. It's a, it is a rhetorical question. I, I know the answer, but I want for clarification for the public. If we choose to pass this budget this evening, um, we are not passing the utility rate increases. Those will come back to us at a future date for consideration. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, so the budget, even though it's a recommendation or not a re even a recommendation, it's something that we have to look at because it is a serious matter. We are not passing any rate increases this evening. Um, let's see. I agree with Ms. Uh, Martner that we spent a lot of time. There's probably a few questions in here, but we've been, we've been over this thing now for eight months. And if we don't know the answers right now, if we don't, have the answers um, if we don't have the answers to our questions by now it's probably a little bit late because this is a work of a lot of people put over the past eight months that really did what we had set out to do and that's present a balanced budget so thanks to the four of you as well it was, I think it's been a pleasure <laughs> <laughs> thank you well, and, and uh, as it was pointed out to me earlier, that a budget is a, um, it's a living document, and sometimes living documents have to have life changes. So as we go along, if something doesn't work out, we have the ability to change it, and that's the way life is. No, he, he stopped. He stopped talking. Well, no, you, so. you interrupted me. Oh. No, actually, um, you brought up a real good point, and that's one more recommendation I'd like to do. Um, as we did with the last budget, I'd like to make sure that we have Mr. Wilkie come back to us on a quarterly basis to review and update this budget as needed. Um, so quarterly, a quarterly report on the budget. That would be a, uh, um, a staff recommendation, I guess. So noted. Councilmember Costa? Uh-oh. I think what we ended up with in the 0911 was every six months. Um, every three months is, it, it took me about five weeks to get prepared for each of the six month reviews. So it would be a, a fairly continuous process if we did it every three months. What I meant to say is every two quarters. <laughs> Similarly so noted, Councilmember Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't want to repeat what my colleagues have already stated, but we don't do this too often, so thank you. <laughs> thank you for all your hard work. And I also agree that at this point, um, you know, we have, in order to not micromanage too much, we put in the hands of the departments and they choose what's best for their department as far as cutting. They know what the, their budget is and they've stuck to that, which is why we now have a balanced budget. So, I mean, at, at this point as a document, I'm very satisfied and I really appreciate the hard work and thank you for being so patient with me as I was learning um, that I was looking over a hundred and what, how much, how much money is it? I'm still, it's, it's still hard for me to wrap my head around $173 million. Um, a budget um, so thank you for that the one thing I want to say because I know I'll get an email if I don't which is that um, funding of our priority as far as laptops and technology is concerned that will result in either um, an equal amount of spending and maybe in some cases a net savings so I just want to make sure that that's not an additional cost for me that's going to replace the printing cost that's already here just wanted to clarify that thank you and that's a first year toss and a second year savings. Yes. Councilmember Starbuck, and could you confine your comments to five minutes, please? I'm happy with it. I move that we approve the biennial budget resolution number 5725, paragraph 11. Yeah, I'm sorry we do, but let's see. Is there anyone out there who would like to comment on this? 
stuff is not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, seeing no one rise, now you can make that motion, Councilmember Starbuck. On fear of repeating myself, I move that we accept the biennial budget resolution number 5725, paragraph 11. I second that motion. I'd like to third. Who's the fourth and the fifth? Come on, you guys. Come on. Huh? Oh, golly. You guys are no fun. Okay. Is there any further discussion on this subject? And then we should vote. And that it passes unanimously, 5-0. And now, written communications. There are none that have not already been presented. Oral communications, the last chance to stand up. Seeing no one rise, we'll close that. Council agency development requests, comments, and meeting reports. I should have said this earlier, but you were saying all these thank yous, and I just want to make sure that we pass it along to this is my first go around with the city, you know, it's not my first go around with the budget, but the assistance from everybody from the top all the way down to Johnny, who helped put it together. Uh, directors, my fellow directors, the my staff, I'm just very thankful for that, that assistance. So that's all I wa wanted to say. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, any council agency reports? I'd like to report that I went to a bunch of meetings. I drove a bunch of miles. I didn't spend any city money, but I did give Councilmember Costa a ticket that I paid for to something, and she's going to go. So now she has to put it on her on her fund campaign disclosure for uh, disclosure form. And who's next? Let, let me go real quick. Okay. Um, I've got a, a council request that I'd like to make. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to have staff initiate the process for the Public Safety Commission to meet monthly, vice um, bi-monthly on the last Wednesday of the month. <laughs> I'd kind of like to do that as soon as possible, if I could, the, the process. Um, they current, explain how they currently meet. <laughs> the Public Safety Commission meets bi-monthly. Like they every, every two they want to, to start meeting monthly, and so they were, were kind of in a quagmire as to how they were going to do it. They were going to write a letter. They were going to go all different direction, and I just said that I would go ahead and make the recommendation that here. Okay, and I second that. Who would like to Mr. be? Mr. Mayor, if – okay, go ahead and second it. I'll I second it. Now okay. go ahead. Um, I don't believe it's necessary. I believe they have that ability right now. As part of their, they they can meet as as they choose. They do not have to make any formal requests. So, uh, correct. But I've been to some of the previous meetings, and there was a request that they meet monthly, and that hasn't occurred yet. So we're just trying to facilitate that. I think. Yeah. Um, Paperwork wise. They don't they don't need any approval by us. Do we need to make an amendment to the council hand? I mean, not the council handbook, but not I mean the boards and committees and commissions oh. handbook. Oh. Um, go action. for it, Joe. Someone asked me about this. I looked at the handbook. The, the, their uh, part of the handbook says on the request of the chair or the majority of the board, they can meet whenever they want to meet. Okay. So it's Suffice to say they can and we approve it. Okay. Next? No. Nope. I'll get to you, Chief. Don't go away. <laughs> Any other council requests or announcements? <clears throat> council member... Costa. Oh, no, sorry. Lingle. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but getting back to the Public Safety Commission, I'd like to make a council request, and the council request is that as soon as we can arrange it, I'd like to have a joint meeting with the Public Safety Commission to give us an update on their discussion on the Olson report. We tonight approved a budget that is reducing our public safety and several months ago we made a um, or we directed the Public Safety Commission to start working on the implementation of the Olson report so I'd like to have a joint meeting just to give them an update as to where they are as um, if they have any questions on how we would like to see it implemented maybe give them a little bit more direction but so that's my request is that we uh, arrange for a joint meeting with the City Council on uh, with the Public Safety Commission <laughs> to give us an update. 
Councilmember Costa has voted yes on that. <laughs> I pressed the wrong button. I'm so tired. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Oh my gosh, what was my, oh, would you prefer, maybe that can coincide with the workshop we're having on term limit, just have it at the same time? Well, it's not really a workshop. We, usually what we do is, it's a joint meeting. We use it prior to the general meeting. We just have them come and sit in and we have a little discussion maybe half an hour before the uh, general council meeting. Okay. And that's open to the public to attend as of well? Course. Yeah. Yes, okay. Of course, yes, of course, yeah. Sure. Okay, so uh, everybody got their head nodding up and down on that? Okay, city administrator. Okay, and are you done, Councilmember Lingle? Um, and now, the man with the gun. Mayor, City Council members, just for a point of clarification, the, the Public Safety Commission has been meeting monthly since March. <laughs> We're always the last to know. Okay, and now, just for once, I'd like to give our city administrator the last word. Tag, you're it. You get to close the meeting. Are you asking me to adjourn the meeting? <laughs> okay, I will reiterate my thank yous to each of you. Uh, Councilmember Martner, Councilmember Costa, Councilmember Starbuck, Councilmember Lingle, and Mayor Lynn for all your hard work and support of staff during this budget process. Thank you for adopting the budget tonight and good night. We are adjourned to the Lompoc City Council Redevelopment Agency meeting at 7 p.m. on June 21st. Uh, just a moment. And there's one more thing. Uh, the city clerk Alvarez just asked, uh, did we report on the closed session tonight? Good point. There was okay. no reportable action in the closed session. Thank you for the catch. <laughs>